So this is part one of the product animation masterclass and we are going to model a can. It's very simple and if you follow along with the instructions or the reference then you'll do just fine. You can also use your own product and skip on over to video 4 where I'm going to explain some fundamentals about the graph editor. If you do want to model along, no problem. I tried making this free course as beginner friendly as possible. But if you are an experienced Blender user, just model it yourself faster and I'll see you in the next video. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so I'm starting in a new Blender scene and we're going to select both of these objects and delete it. Then I'm going to add a reference image because we need it for our reference. And here we have our textures and we get the Coke cans. I've placed the Coke cans in the Patreon for free so you can use that to follow along with this tutorial. Let's go ahead and bring this towards the side so we get the 3D cursor somewhat in the middle of this long Coke can because I'm going to use the long Coke can for this commercial. So let's add a cylinder. You could use the screw modifier method, you know, where you outline the edge of this entire thing and then use the screw modifier. But I find that the cylinder works just as well and it's so easy. So we're just going to do that. So I'm going to select the bottom side of this cylinder, press on tree on the numpad to align it with our view. And now I'm going to bring this down, pressing on G and C. Now, the first thing I'm noticing, our cylinder is not scaled big enough. And I'm only looking at one side here because we want this to be correct on one side. We're probably not going to get it right on both sides. I'm going to select the bottom part, press 3. As you can see, this part is a little bit skewed. It's probably because of the perspective of the camera looking down a little bit on the can itself. So we have to take that into account when we are modeling this. But first, let's go over here and we can see that it has some slight curvature going down. We're just going to follow that and make sure that that fits. And what I'm saying about the perspective, I think this should be correct. And if it doesn't, we can always change it. So I'm going to press I and hold shift to change the size of our new circle. And I'm going to bring it in something like this. And I'm going to press I again and bring it very close to here. And then GC and bring this upwards. Not too much, just a little bit because on the bottom of the can, it's always like indented a little bit, right? Uh, so now we're going over to this side of the can and we're already very far in the process, not even doing very much. So we're going to press G, Z, bring it upwards. And I can see that there's a seam right here, or at least uh, the curvature starts from this point onwards. I'm going to press G and C, bring it towards that point. And now I'm going to press on three once again and follow along with the curvature. See, uh, as the scale, bring it upwards as the scale, bring it upwards and this part is pretty straight. So right now we have then got this part of the can, no problem, E, S and scale it like so, bring it upwards just a little bit, scale it a bit, and then go like so. I feel like it has a, a little bit of a bevel or cur uh, curved edge. So we're just going to scale it like that, E, S, and then do it back again. And it's quite hard to see because it's white on white, but I think we can eyeball it pretty decently, like so. Uh, so this is the basis of our can for the first part. Now let's add a subdivision surface modifier, see what it looks like. Going over here to the normals and auto smooth. Maybe we have an edge loop too much. I'm going to delete this edge loop. Ah, that looks a little bit better. And maybe we can take this one in a little bit and scale it just a little on this side. Now that looks a lot more natural. We're going to bring in a new reference image. First of all, let's save this. Free course can. GX, let's bring it towards there. And now I'm going to add in another reference image right over here and it's the top of the can. We're going to press on seven on the numpad and I'm just going to make sure that it's the size of our can. Like so. Uh, so now we can view it by pressing Alt Z and we can watch right through this uh, as we're modeling. I'm going to select the top part. Seven. I'm going to place another one right here just for 
demonstration purposes and I can observe what it actually looks like. We're going to model the part all the way over here. Then on this part, we're going to move around some vertices. And after we've got that, we've got this general shape. I'm going to bring it in and then make this, uh, this final part of the can. We press I, bring it inwards. And now it has to go down as well, all right? So we're going to disable our subdivision surface modifier. And now we're going to press G and C and bring this down. Scale it just a little bit. I, and somewhere around here, just going to check S and make sure that we follow this kind of curvature right here. So now I'm going to add another loop cut right here by pressing Control R, pressing G, C, and bringing it down so that we get that can shape right over there. And if we look at this with our subdivision surface modifier, it is kind of working out the way we want it to. Not entirely there yet, but it's getting there. So right here, we can select our top part, I, to inset an S and bring it right over here. Here, another area starts. So this is actually a bit more down. I'm going to press I and GC, bring this down. And the same goes for this part, I once more. Then bring it upwards with GC and I once more and bring it downwards with GC. And I'm going to press I once again and bring it down. Maybe it's a little bit too much to the top. So I'm just going to select this edge loop, control plus, plus, uh, control minus. Select this one by hand, GC, and bring it down just a little bit. Let's see what that looks like. Ah. That's starting to look like a can. We're going to select this. I am going to press I one more time. And make sure the bottom curvature aligns with this uh, edge already. So that's going to save us some work. Now, pressing on one, we can select these vertices and move them around in order to change the shape and get it exactly as we want it to. And this is just simply pressing G and moving the vertices around our shape. We're almost there. I'm just going to drag around some vertices and have some fun with this in the process. So right now we've got this entire part. Press I, bring it inwards. As you can see, there's a slight dent over there. So we're just going to replicate it once more. Press I. GC. We're just going to do that one more time. And this time I'm going to press E. Maybe it's a bit sharp around here. So we're going to select this loop cut, press S. And now this looks kind of soft. Uh, I'm not sure if it's deep enough, so we're just going to press uh, G and C. I'm going to turn off the subdivision surface modifier. I like to see what I'm doing. I, E. And uh, I think this makes sense. Alt set. I, skill, and get this curvature aligned. And now what we want to do is press X, delete it. Select this entire area by holding Alt and clicking on the edge. Then press on the grid fill option. And this one we're going to fill with the grid. Something like this, maybe even 10. Ah, look at this, nine. Nine would be fine. So now we've got some other vertices to move around once more. And this is the way we're just going to shape it like so, very easy. Just dragging around some vertices in order to follow along with the shape. Now we've got this entire area. I'm just going to select everything. We can smooth it out first. So let's see, we've got the smooth tool right here. Make it just a little bit smoother. Like so. And then some of these vertices are not in the correct position anymore, so we're just going to change that. All right, cool. Now let's select all of these, holding control and shift. It follows the shortest path. I, 
G and C. All right, that looks like uh, the structure that's in there. Very nice. I feel like this could be scaled a little bit more like so. And control plus and shift E in order to make it a bit sharper, but not too sharp. Let's add another loop cut right there. All right, so now we're going to model this part of the can. And excuse me, my camera kind of went out. I'm going to add a plane. And this plane I'm going to bring upwards, scale it. We can also just model it on this one right here and it will be a little bit more clear what we're doing. Uh, so I'm going to bring this to this side. S, X, S, Y. And now we've got a very thin part. Control R to make a loop cut. I'm going to delete this side, add a modifier, type mirror, and now we've got it all mirrored. And now I'm just going to follow along with the shape as intended, I'm using only the rotate and scale tool. So E, bring it upwards, maybe scale it a little bit like this, E, and going to bring it something like so. R. Make sure to follow along with the curvature or else you're not going to uh, get it right. E. Move it around like so. We can also press on Y or X to have it aligned with the right space. And now we can pretty much bring it entirely over here. I think what I want to do is I want to follow this part first and then from there on we can uh, follow the rest. E and bring it over here, scale it. E, bring it over here, scale it. Make sure that it follows the curvature correctly. R, like so. And E, and now it should be straight. So we're going to press Alt C, uh, I mean SX0 and bring it over here. Now on the mirror uh, modifier, we can select clipping. And as soon as we bring it in there, it doesn't go any further and now it is correct. So what have we got over here? We need some loop cuts. I'm going to add some loop cuts right here. And I'm going to place this like so. I'm going to place this like so. And now it follows along with the curvature a lot nicer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of these parts, bring it inwards, scale it on the Y and something like this SX0 because I want it to be straight all the way over here. Now we can add an extra loop cut like so and scale it so that it follows along with the curvature a lot more nicely. I'm just going to select this, press E and bring it towards this side. And now that's pretty much uh, a lot of this can part done. All right, so what's actually happening here, we cannot see it because it's a very low resolution image, but there is a circular object going right around this because that's the way that this uh, can opener or whatever you call it is hold in place or else it would just be lying on top of the can. But there's a circle right here, which is attached to the can itself. And this is the clip. And now the circle goes through this tinier hole of the clip so that it remains stuck to the can itself. And we can go ahead and make that right now. So I'm going to select all of these edges and bring it in closer by scaling. So I'm going to press E once again and scale it. But as you saw, we must make sure not to go over like this because then we get a triangle right here. We're going to make it follow the shape by adjusting it by hand perfectly ourselves. So right now we have got this curvature shape going on right here, but we've also got this empty loop that we're going to have follow our new curvature right there. So let's bring it upwards, G, C, E, scale, rotate. You know the name of the game by now. 
And uh, it looks like this is wider, but mm, I'm not really trusting it. Do this by eye and make sure that it's the same scale all throughout. SX0, make sure it's straight and bring it in there. And now we've got our perfect little hole for our other circle to come through and hold this can thing in place. There are some uh, interesting shapes going on over here. You, as you can see, it is going upwards slightly and downwards. And there is these kind of baffles and what we now pretty much have an empty plane. I'm going to press control three and add our subdivision service modifier. As you can see, it already looks a lot better. Now we're going to apply our mirror. But before we do that, I'm going to make a backup of this. Press M to make a new collection and call it backup can. And now I'm going to turn this off, make sure that we do not see it. And I'm going to apply our mirror and it looks like a pretty nice shape, not bad at all. So I'm going over here right now, there is no geometry to this space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press E and bring it upwards. Now this might mess around with our normals and the way the entire uh, shape looks. I'm just going to add a loop cut and bring it upwards and a loop cut and bring it downwards. I think it's a bit too much. I'm just going to skate it on the set axis. Shade smooth, it should be even smaller, I believe, something like this. But now we have our shapes and geometry for this side. As you can see, this is going upwards a little bit. So we're just going to replicate that uh, by adding a loop cut over here, G, C. And I feel like that is a more natural shape for this thing to follow. Now, as you can see, there is a, a slight indentation right here. I'm just going to select all of these lines all the way over here. Yeah, this is about right. We actually need two more of those. I'm just going to do that. And now bring it down, shift E, and see what that looks like with the subdivision surface modifier on. All right, uh, a little bit softer. All right, we're getting there. This is uh, starting to look pretty good. I'm just going to drag it over here and bring it in the same shape as our reference. Bring it down and have it lie on our can like so. And we're just going to add another cylinder, scale it down, Scale it down. Now I'm going to make a loop cut, GG to move it upwards. GG. I'm going to select this entire part. And then I'm going to press Alt S, uh, no, Alt E, in order to extrude faces along the normals. And then now I'm going to scale up this entire thing just a little bit. Scale it down on the Z axis, make sure it is nice and smooth because of our subdivision surface modifier. This is the final shape of the top. And as you can see right here, the bottom side actually has a slight harder edge and we have not incorporated that into our model as of yet. So this is the final adjustment for this model. Press Ctrl R to make a loop cut. Going to bring it towards this side. I'm going to turn this off for a little second. And now I'm going to I'm going to make this line a lot sharper and stronger and maybe do it on the inside as well. So this is our final can. In this part of the free masterclass, you'll learn how to add different textures together using different UV maps. You'll learn how to unwrap the mesh properly. And I'm also going to explain about alpha masks and how to use a mix color node the right way. I'm certain that you'll learn quite a few things. And at the end of this process, we will have a model with a texture that we can use throughout the entire free course. So without further ado, let's get started. So yes, welcome to the second part. We are now going to start the texturing process. You're going to learn a lot of awesome stuff right now because we're using several different UV maps. We have to mix together several different textures in order to make it look good. So we're just going to make two materials in total. And first of all, we have got our object right here, as you noticed from the previous tutorial. I have done one extra thing though, and I didn't tell you guys about it. I used Control J to add it to our object because I'm not going to make animations with this where it's going to open up or anything like that. We're just going to move around the can so it can pretty much be attached to it. And that's why I did that. You can do that as well by uh, basically just taking this, 
clicking on this and pressing Ctrl J and then you've got it over there. Now don't forget about the cylinder as well. You also got to add that to the can, I almost forgot. I'm going over into the EV shading part right now. I'm going to turn off my statistics by the way, because I think it dilutes from the entire project. We want there to be two different materials on this object. And we can do that uh, by selecting all of these parts and selecting all of these parts and assigning their own materials to them. So, so we're going to select the bottom circle of this can. Press Ctrl plus, 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 plus and all of this can be aluminium. So I am going to go over to materials, assign, and I'm going to call this aluminium. Very good. And I've assigned it. We're going to press on one to go into this view, press alt set to look through it, press B to box select. And now we can select all of these lines And you can see it doesn't actually select everything we need. It doesn't matter because we can now press on 7. Press box select once again. Pop. And as you can see, we now have everything we need. And I'm going to assign this. I'm going to select this part. This part, this part, this part. Pretty much the middle of the can. Give this a new material as well. So assign, new. This is going to be our text body. Now, this is a trick that you might want to know about. If I click on aluminium and you press select right over here, you can only do this in edit mode, by the way. It selects the materials, uh, the parts of the mesh that we gave this material. And we can also deselect it like this and select our other parts. So you don't have to select it every time by hand uh, if you have already got your material set up. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to make the text body material. It's on slot two in this case, because we made the aluminium first. You can just press over here and it will work out. I'm going to add an image texture to this. And I have placed all the files in the Patreon link. If you want to use that, you can. Uh, I've made my own and the way I did that is I can actually show you. I went into a fusion composition. I added text, it's right over here by the way. Contains absolute awesomeness, might cause shocks in the viewer. This will help you grow your business. I hope so guys, I hope this really works out for you. The Blender Ender, the font I used is Bauhaus. 93 and for other fonts I used Franklin Gothic Demi. I just made some of these interesting patterns, turned some of them around and uh, now I've basically got my text image. You can do this for yourself as well. So uh, I would actually recommend doing that so that you can use your own brand on your can and that way you are building your portfolio efficiently or you're just giving me free attention, which I also appreciate, so don't matter. You can download these files for free on Patreon and just use them. I've also got a symbol texture and we're going to use, we're going to mix those two textures together. Anyway, back in Blender, open. And I am going to bring in our can text. And right here, it is not aligned the correct way. Not a problem, I'm just going to unwrap it. And as you can see, it distorts the entire mesh. So let's drag this over here. We can use this little plus icon, drag it over here, then select a UV editor. And it's making a circle out of it. The reason why it does that is because this is a cylinder and we have forgot one very important step of this process. We have to make a seam. Uh, because if we make a seam, the program can understand, oh, all right, so I need to fold it open like this. You know, like those cube boxes that you used to have on high school or middle school, and you had to fold them into each other. Basically that. So I'm going to select this edge all the way until this edge. Press U and click on Mark Seam. And you know what? I'm just going to select this edge as well and select that edge as well. U, Mark Seam. And now when I select our text body entirely by clicking here on the material on our select options and press unwrap, we get a perfect square rectangle, whatever. R180, because it is upside down, we do not want it to be upside down. I'm going to scale it on the x-axis, bring it down towards this side. I see that this is very much stretched. I do not like that, so I'm going to scale it on the y-axis as well until I'm happy. And I'm happy somewhere around here. That's very good. I'm going to make it a bit smaller, maybe. Maybe something like this. Just play around with this until you're happy. All right, so that's it for the text, pretty easy. Now I'm going to use some standard values for a can that I like to use on the principal BSDF. I am going to increase the metallic slider to one. 
and I'm going to increase the roughness to 0.52 and this determines the reflections that we get on this can. Doesn't have to be a lot. So I'm going into the specular and the specular has kind of changed the way it looks but uh, it's still pretty much the same as it used to be. I'm just going to place it on 0.72 and the anisotropic can be set to 1. Uh, you cannot see anything happening when you do this because uh, I think it only works in cycles. Light, area, let's bring it over here. Just increase the light. So something like this. And now we can actually see something happening. So the anisotropic is changing the way that the light is distributed on the can. In case you wanted to know. So uh, what we're going to do now is add a, cl a clear coat which is uh, kind of an extra layer of paint that goes over things in order to protect it from uh, weathering and stuff like that. But it also gives it this uh, shiny look. Oh, I'm going to increase the weight of this to one. And this is way too shiny. As you can see, the area lamp is being reflected entirely in this. We do not want that. So we have to play around with our roughness. I'm going to set it to 0.15. Uh, this is already starting to look a lot better. Maybe we can go for 0.2 or 18 and this looks pretty good. And this is kind of the way that it can reflect if you notice in real life. It could be actually a little bit more reflective, like 0.15. We're just going for 0.15, why not? We increase the specularity, you can see that in the metal a little bit. You can play around with this, you can increase or decrease the roughness. I'm just going to set it to this value. This is one of our UV maps. And I am going to duplicate this principal BCF. I'm going to add in another image texture by pressing Ctrl T because now I want to add the symbol to this can textures. And we've got our cool pattern for the can. The way I made this actually is by going into my advanced environment tutorial from the table scene I did. And I made some Baroque uh, type models for in the background and I just took one of those I placed it on a black screen made it white and then uh, I got my own alpha image for these uh, for this type of symbol so you can do that with whatever texture or model you have very simple way to just make your own this is the texture now if we want to use this uh, with a texture map and we can move it up and down but rotating doesn't really work it kind of stretches it out same like this, rotation on the X, it doesn't work. Yeah, it just doesn't work like this. That's what I'm trying to say. So let's remove this. What we want to do is we want to combine these two textures together. We can press Ctrl-0 by selecting both principal BCFs. Press Ctrl-0 and now we get a mix node. Now as you can see, the uh, text is right over there and it's being distorted right at the seam because uh, that's where there's some trouble. So we can just change that by using the Y value on our mapping node and moving our text to a different part. This is the way it looks like right now, but I want this to sit on top of my text. So I'm going to select it and we've got our two materials right over there. Let me show you what happens if we just simply try to combine those by just placing this one right over here. Now, as you can see, the textures kinda add to each other and they give this weird middle value you can still see like the symbol underneath the text and it just looks weird we want to use the text and cut out a part of the symbol so only the text is visible there because the text is on top the way this works and i'm going to show you i've already prepared my sphere uh, and this is the texture for my sphere i use the gradient texture and make this part black now i got a mixed color node and I've got my cool pattern. So I've added my cool pattern right here to the, uh, to the sphere. And I've got a gradient over here. I've added a multiply with a factor to one. And let's see what happens. Ah, so when it's black on this side and we use the multiply, it removes this entire area. And this is actually what we want to apply for our can. We are going over into our can. Let's remove the sphere for now. And we want to use this area of text to remove a part of this symbol. But first, the symbol needs to be located at the place that I want it to be at. First, I'm going to this tab where we have our vertex groups and there's also a tab here for UV maps. And this is our UV map. I'm going to bring in a UV map node and select this UV map. And instead of using the texture coordinate, I'm going to use this UV map. And 
nothing should change because this is our UV map. Now I'm going to click on the plus button right here and create a new UV map. You have to select it by pressing on this camera icon right over there. Delete this and bring in a UV map and select our second UV map and bring it into the factor. And now when we unwrap this, nothing happened with the text, but something did happen with our symbol. And that's exactly what we wanted. So now I'm going to press R and 90 and have it rotate like this. Looks pretty cool already. I'm going to make it a tad bit smaller, bring it upwards. And if you press on this button right here, you can actually see what you're doing. And I like seeing what I'm doing. First of all, I'm going to make it something like this. Bring it down a bit. Looks like it's uh, pretty much in the middle. And now this looks pretty cool. But we still have our problem where the text is seeing true. And we do not want that. So we're going to control zero and create a mix node. And now I'm going to use a multiply and set the factor to one. And uh, now what is happening? Nothing much. Uh, reason for it, we need to invert the color. So I'm going to shift A, invert color, and I inverted this color. So now this is black. And as you remembered from the sphere, everything that is black will be removed. So we've got our white symbol. We placed our black text over it and remove whatever is black from the white symbol. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so that is what happened. And now our text is actually over our symbol. And that is very cool. Now I'm going to duplicate this mix color node and I'm going to set it to mix. And the reason I'm doing that, because we can now use this symbol as a factor for this mix node, which means that everything that is white uh, will be a certain color and everything that is black will be the other color. Now we've already assigned a point A and in the point B we can assign what is white within the symbol to be a different color. That's the way a mask works. So if I change this color, it's going to be blue or red or orange or make it whatever you want it to be. Uh, the colors of my brand or my channel are blue and orange. So I'm just going for blue and I always use this for anything I, uh, I do. Blue and orange is just my favorite. And here I'm going to add a U and saturation value node. And now if you think that this blue is not strong enough, uh, which I can fully understand that you can increase the saturation and it will be a stronger blue. But before we can see if this actually works out the way we want it to, I want to add some bump to this. Add a bump node, take our image, into the height, into the normal. And now we've got this cool looking bump. Our text is going through now once again. So actually we want to use this multiply in the bump. And now it works out. So we're going to change the strength to something way less. I think 0 0.3 or something would be fine. Maybe 0.2 even, 0.25. Looks pretty cool. So that's pretty much it for this texture. And uh, as I told you, we've got our hue and saturation node. And now we can very easily change the hue within the white of our symbol. So pick whatever color you like. I'm just going for blue, 0.5, it's my blue. You can change the saturation to make it a stronger blue or a softer blue. I'm going for 1.63 and the value determines how white or how light or how dark it is. And actually this looks pretty cool if you ask me. If you just turn it down entirely, you only got the bump, very cool. But I'm not going to do that. Value on one, maybe even a little bit brighter, 1.23. So we're going to make our second texture now, which is going to be the aluminium for the rest of the can. And the way I'm going to do it is by going over to slot one. And here we've got an entirely empty scene. Press A somewhere in this empty space and press point. And now we can find our nodes. And the principle B is the F is located right over here. And I'm going to add a noise texture. If you want to know how I did that so quickly, I've actually assigned some customized shortcuts in order to get my noise textures quicker because otherwise you have to type it each time. I don't like that. So noise texture is my shift one. Uh, this will not work for you unless you enable that. I've got an entire tutorial on this and how to do it. Control T. So this is our texture node. I'm going to increase it by a whole lot. 
plug it into the object, by the way, because then it will be deformed in the shape of the object itself. Uh, this is starting to look pretty cool. Detail, always up, control, and increase the metallic. And decrease the roughness. I'm going to change this color to a darker grayish. And increase the whites on this a little bit. I'm just going to add another noise texture, plug it into this factor, use a bump, 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 and add it to the height, add the bump to the normal. Now it's way too much, probably. Yeah, way too much. So we're going to decrease that by a whole lot. 0 0.01. That looks uh, pretty much like a can. I'm not entirely sure about it yet. Let's see it in cycles. So let's add an HDRI just real quick in order to see what it looks like. ECHDRI. Yeah, so we are going to increase the specularity clear coat. Yeah, something like this. Something could be better. Yeah, I think I think it's in the roughness. And that's how you get a beautiful looking can. So our can is looking very fine. I think with other HDRIs it will look fine as well. And there you go. It looks pretty cool. It looks pretty realistic if you ask me. In this video you're going to learn how to make a professional looking backdrop and we're also going to learn how and why we should scale our objects in order to get correct lighting and camera effects. It's going to be relatively quick compared to other videos in this free masterclass, but what you'll learn is very important and must be taken to heart. Why? Well, because lighting makes or breaks a scene. So without further ado, let's get started. We're going to do some lighting. And over here in the World Properties tabs, uh, we can decrease the strength to zero. And now the entire world will be black. And that is what we want. I'm going to add an area lamp. And uh, the first thing you notice, we've got an area lamp and it's pretty much not lighting up our scene. And the reason for that is because our scale is whack. So right here, the C scale is at 1.92 meters. I don't know about you guys, but there are no cans that are approximately two meters high. So we need to put this to another scale in order for the camera to function properly as well. This will save us a lot of headaches in the future. It will make sure that the camera operates accurately and we definitely want that. What I'm going to do is I'm going over into our modeling material tab and right over here, I'm going to select one of these edges, specifically this one by pressing Alt and clicking on one of these edges and Shift S, cursor to selected. And right here for our pivot point, we are going to select the 3D cursor. And now I am simply going to scale this down until this can is a reasonable size. Now, what is a reasonable size? I've got a can right here and I've got my phone. My phone is approximately 16 and a half centimeters. I'm going to make this can 15 centimeters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my eye on the dimensions. By the way, if you want this tab, you can press on N and you get this tab right here in the item properties. So right here we can see the C scale and it's at 0.276 now. I'm just going to decrease it until it's at 0.15, like so. And this is now actually the proper size of our can. And I'm going to bring this up to have it sit right on top of our grid. And this makes it easier to view things in the future. Now I am going to put my selection cursor to select it, add a plane. And this is going to be our backdrop. So I'm going to increase the size of this. Oh, by the way, uh, let's have a look at uh, what the lighting did. So if I just go to my material properties right now, we can actually see that the light is working even on only 10 watt. And uh, this is what we want. So let's continue on. I'm going to make this backdrop and I'm going to increase the size on the X scale. And I'm going to make sure that it's entirely at the bottom of this can so that the can sits on the plane. Very good. So I'm going to go over to edit mode and click on this edge right here. Press E, C, and pull it upwards. Now I'm going to select this line over here, control B to bevel it, and then increase the bevel size by scrolling up on the mouse wheel. And now I'm going to shade it smooth, and as I uh, press on three, we get our backdrop and everything right over here. And I'm going to select the camera, bring it closer. So this lighting is already pretty cool if you ask me, but there's some things we can improve. So let's go over here. And I'm going to take this light, bring it a little bit closer, 
scale it on the z-axis. By the way, we can go away from our pivot point and set it to median point once again. And have it project its light on the can somewhere around this area. And now I'm going to add another uh, area light. Light area. Rx90, turns it the wrong way. Rx180. And go over here to the y-axis. And let's have a look. Ah, that is starting to look pretty cool. We can play around with the size right here and it will make it softer or harder, uh, depending on what you want. I kind of like it like this. Maybe we can place it backwards just a little bit to have it really sit on that edge. Something like this. And now we're just going to play around with uh, the strength of this. Make sure that it's uh, pretty visible and all. Okay, like so. Now we've got another problem. This is not entirely centered. So I'm going over into the camera and I'm going over into the composition guides, center. And now we have our lines here to make sure that it's entirely in the center. As you can see, it is not. So I'm going to change that by pressing G on the Y axis and moving it exactly to the center. And now this is entirely in the center. Uh, I also want my passepartout which is right over here, and I'm going to increase it to one, and this makes sure that uh, everything outside of the camera is invisible. I find that this works a lot better. Now, we're going to turn off our center, and we're going to turn on thirds, because I want to show you something. I'm going to duplicate this can, and place one right over there, and then place it right on this grid line. And this makes sure that the composition looks nice, the rule of thirds, it's pretty common in photography, and this will make sure that your render looks absolutely cool. Now. I am going to change this texture, so I'm first going to copy it because I don't want to change the texture of this one. I'm just going to copy it and uh, right now we are working in a different material. Now what I want to do is I want to change the color of this black part and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to press Shift A, add a mix color node, plug it right in here and as you can see it does some funky stuff which I do not like, but if we change the color it changes the color. However, it is not entirely operating the way I want it to be because it's kind of mixing with the black and you get a darker value orange. I don't want that. So I'm going to use this very same alpha image as the factor in this mixed color node. And right now you see that everything that has white in the alpha image is showing the orange. Now we want it to be the other way around, so I'm going to plug it into B instead of A. And now I'm going to change this color. And there you go, our letters are still white, but we can change the color of our can. Now I'm going to make it into the uh, colors of my channel, which are blue and orange. You can choose whatever brand colors you like. I like orange and blue, so deal with it. And then I'm going to delete, uh, or no, copy this and place it on the other thirds, like so. I'm going to copy the texture once again, this time, I'm going to change it to blue, something like this. And it already looks pretty cool. This dark area is too dark and I do not like that because it doesn't give us the amount of control that we would like to have in the color grading process. So what I did is I added an extra area lamp and it's very subtle. As you can see, it doesn't do that much, but it does enough. So where it is, it is right over here. It's a very big area lamp because I wanted the light to be soft. So I in increased the size to about eight meters over here and it's 30 watts. And I placed it somewhat like with an angle towards the can. As you can see, it fills up the blacks just a little bit so that it's not too dark. This is just entirely crushed blacks. And this makes uh, sure that we have a lot more control over the final outcome in the color grading process. So that's why I did that. But for now, I find this to be looking quite cinematic, quite cool. We can do one more thing. We can go over into our camera, go to the depth of field and select the can. Now, as you can see, these cans are being blurred out and it looks so much better. It gives it this cinematic quality that otherwise you would not have. Now, let me show you what would happen uh, if we were to select all of this. So select the plane, select this, select this and that. And then I'm going to scale it up, have it go back to two meters. What was it? Two meters, something like that. And now we do not have enough light, so I'm going to increase the world lighting just for demonstration purposes. As you can see, our bokeh effect is kind of gone. And the reason for this is because the scaling is not correct and that's why we changed the scale of the can. Because otherwise you would have to go into the camera right here 
and change the f-stop. Now an f-stop of 2.8 is already a very wide lens which already lets in a lot of light and makes sure that you get that cool bokeh background. There are special lenses that can go up to 1.4 or down to 1.4 but in this case in order to get this background as blurry as we want it you would have to set it to like 0.8 and it's just really unnatural. So if you work in the right scale and I'm just going to control set all of that because it's rubbish but if you work in the right scale your camera effects and your lighting will look way better. So that's what we want and that's what we did. So that's the thing. That's pretty much it for the lighting setup. We made a backdrop, we placed our lighting into the scene, we have made some different cans and now we need to add our water droplets to the cans which will make it look even better. We used to do water droplets on a can using particle systems. However, since geometry nodes we can have a lot more control over our particles and it's a lot faster too. So we're going to learn a very simple geometry node setup for droplets on the can. If you're this far in the free masterclass consider subscribing so without further ado let's get started so we've got our scene set up we've got our cans we've got our textures we've got our lighting we are going to open a new tab right over here and i'm going to set it to geometry node editor very cool press n to remove that and now i'm going to zoom in what i'm going to do is i'm going to press on new and right here we get our group input let me make this smaller so you can actually see what's going on. I'm going to remove this so that we only have our can right here and our geometry node set up. I'm going to distribute points on faces and on those faces I will distribute another texture or material or object actually which is going to be an icosphere. So I'm going to mesh icosphere. All right so it's right over here our icosphere and I'm going to pull this up and give it a new material. We can remove the UV editor by the way, no need to keep that around. And I'm going into the transmission, increase the weight of the transmission and now it will already be a little bit transparent. It looks uh, kind of hazy. Uh, so we're going to decrease the roughness to something around uh, 0.150. And this makes sure that we've got a water droplet. Very cool. And now we're going into our can and we can drag our icosphere right here. We're going to need it later. First thing I'm going to add, Shift A, Join Geometry, because I want to keep my can. And that's why I added Join Geometry, because as soon as we add other nodes to it, it will remove the can, but only use its structure. We don't want that, we want to keep the can, so I'm going to use the Join Geometry to make that happen. And now I'm going to add a Distribute Points on Faces. And now, as you can see, we get all these points on the face. And this is why we added a join geometry node because we can now take the geometry and plug it right in here. And as you can see, we've got our can and our points on the faces. Now on these points, instance on points, we want to have our icosphere. Geometry, instance, and whoa, what's going on? Well, it's way too big and that's a problem, but it's solvable. So we're going to do that by adding a random value and plugging that random value into the scale. Now, it doesn't solve our problem just yet because we need to add a map range node, place it right in here, and now we can decide the range in between the sizes of our icosphere. So we are going to decrease the two max because the max value is way too high. That's why it's making our icospheres way too big. So I'm going to decrease that like so. <laughs> and as you can see, we already have some randomized drops in size. So some of them are different sizes than others. And we can play around with these values in order to make it look good. So 0 0.03. Uh, the from max, I'm just going to leave it to 1. And as you can see, we've got a couple of cool droplets on this can. Now, what if we want to change the amount of droplets? No problem, we can do that. I'm going to take the group input and put it into the density. Now, why did I do that? Because now we can go over to our modifiers and under the geometry nodes section, we have a value that we can change, namely the density. So if I were to change this to 50, we would get a whole lot more drops. And all of these drops are different in size because of our geometry node setup, which is very nice. So we just can change it around now the way we want it to. I'm going to set it to uh, 20. I think it looks pretty good. There's quite a couple of, uh, of drops now. And this increases the value of the render even more. Now I'm going to increase the size of this and see whether 
me this is enough. And I actually believe it is enough. We want those drops on the other cans as well. So what can we do? We can go over to preferences and then we have the copy attributes menu and you should have this enabled. Then you click on this can, click on that can, click on this can, then search for the copy modifiers. And there you have it. We have some drops on those as well. Not really visible because they're in the background right now, but later on as we'll start animating these, you want to have them on it. So, and that's it for the geometry node part of this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. This is a new workflow. Usually we used to do some particle systems, etc. but now we can just use a modifier, uh, namely the geometry node one and change around our stuff. Very cool and uh, play around with it. See what you can do with it. It's a very simple setup. All right, so I'll see you in the next part where we are going to start with the animations. But first I'm going to visualize what the animations look like in the graph editor because this is the most important part. You can just follow along and drag some of these sliders and make sure that the animation looks right. Or you can actually understand how the graph editor works and what these lines actually represent. And then you'll be able to fish forever, so to speak. So welcome to part five of the free product animation masterclass. I think this video is one of the most important videos to watch on animation. Most people think the graph editor is a scary place. And I used to be like that too. I would open it up and be lost one second into it. And that's why I'm going to explain the graph editor visually so you can truly understand what's going on. Starting now. This is a linear path. There are no fluctuations in speed. The object moves from point A to point B. Now, the cube on the floor shows what it would look like in an animation. I guess everybody understands linear, but what about a Bezier? Look at this. It starts slowly, then speeds up in the middle and slows down again. So let's say you're driving to work in a different city. Then first you have to drive slowly in your own street, because there are children playing soccer, schools are nearby, and speed limitations set up by the government. Then you enter the highway. So you speed up from slow to fast, and now you can finally drive fast on this highway. When you enter the city where your work is located, you have to slow down again until you arrive and stop at your workplace. On the graph editor, it looks like an S shape, which stands for soul sucking nine to five. Now let's say we want an animation to happen very fast at first, but then slow down. What would that look like? It could be a person skiing. So if you start at the top of a mountain and take the leap of faith, you're practically free falling at first. Then as the angle of the mountain decreases, we slow down and come to a halt also due to friction. So if you would push a cube on the floor, it would go fast at first and then slow down because of friction. Another way to visualize this is the other way around. So let's say you're a runner that wants to run up a mountain. At first you're bursting with energy and run up the mountain quickly. But as time progresses, you get tired and slow down your pace until eventually you come to a halt. And this is exactly what's happening in the graph editor as well. And I hope I've shown that to you now and that through these metaphors, you can understand the graph editor for the rest of your career. I believe visualizing the graph editor in this way is very helpful for understanding how it actually works. So in the next part of this free masterclass, we are going to make this animation and really solidify our knowledge and actually animate using the graph editor. We've modeled again, textured it, added a backdrop and made some lighting. Then we made some geometry nodes droplets, watched the video on the graph editor and now it's finally time for the first animation. It's going to be the slide in animation. But first I'm going to tell you about some changes that I made in the scene so you can follow exactly what I did step by step. If you want to skip to the animation part, it's right here. So without further ado, let's get started. I changed a couple of things. I went into the texture of this one and I went to my bottom BSDF and I changed the roughness to one. Why did I do that? Well, I thought that the letters were a bit too much obscured. They were very dark and it is because of the reflections that it added. I do not like that. So I changed the roughness to one so that the white text is clearly visible in all renders. I also went over here to the backdrop and I gave it a material and I changed the value over here to one. That makes it extra white, pretty cool stuff. But those are the things that I changed and I just wanted to let you know so that you can follow along exactly what I did. But I just thought it needed a little more tweaking in order to get to the quality that we want to have for these renders. And now it's time to make an animation. So this is going to be the first animation of the product animation course. I'm going to have this one slide in and those are going to fall from the sky in a certain type of manner and then slide in as well. We are going to make sure that it all looks smooth and if you watched the previous tutorial on how the graph editor actually works then you probably already know how and why we are going to do this in this manner. So first things first I'm going to select this can. 
I'm going to press I and add a location, rotation and scale key frame. I am heading over to frame 35 and I'm going to press into edit mode. And right here on this line, I'm going to press on 2, this line, shift S, cursor to select it. And now for our pivot point, we can change it to 3D cursor. What that does is we can now rotate along this axis. And that is what we want to do. I want it to look like it's going to topple over, but it's not. It's going to revert back to its old state. And uh, the way I'm going to do that is by adding a keyframe right over here. Uh, let's say we are going to do this. I, location, rotation and skill. Then we're going to frame zero and I'm going to move this over to this side. Now let's see what we're doing because I do not want it to start like this. So I'm going to set it back to median point, uh, alt R and then turn it around. So it is already showing the logo, location, rotation and skill. Let's see what that does. All right. So now it's sliding in and stopping. So like that, let's see, no clipping on the underside. And uh, that is what we wanted. It has to be on the plane itself. So if it is clipping on the underside, you have probably followed one step wrong. Uh, either way, this is the way it's going to look like. It looks very static and uh, slow moving. This is not a professional looking animation, but we're going to change that in the graph editor. So right now heading over into the graph editor. What have we got? we have moved this model on the Y axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press this uh, lock button and I'm only going to open up my eye location. Then I press A, point, and I don't like that it's all stretched out like this. So what I want to do, so I'm going into preferences, going to animation, and here you have several different options that you uh, can choose. And I'm going to select only show selected curves. And in this way, once I press the I and select all and press dot, we get our entire animation on the Y location. I just like to work in that fashion. You might not, I do. So let's keep it going like this. If you watched the previous tutorial, you know that we want this to move along on the table and it comes in fast, slows down and goes back to its original position. So the way that we are going to do that is, well, we have to stretch out this line in order to go very fast. And then right over here, it slows down. Very easy stuff. I'm going to select this handle and I'm going to change the handle type. I like working in this fashion because I like to have control over my handles. Because right now, if you move this handle, it also moves the handle on, on the other side, as you can see. And it, it, it does the same over here you know, and it creates these weird looking mountain shapes. We do not want that. So I'm going to select this one, handle type, and set it to free. And now when I move this handle type, it only moves this area and not this area. Uh, we're going to put it up. Why? Because we want it to be fast in the beginning. So right now it's already coming in fast, but it's slowing down too quickly. It's already way too slow over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this upwards to the side. All right, already looking a lot better. Look at this, like so. So it comes to a halt very slowly and it comes back. This is exactly what we wanted. So that is done for the Y location. And already it looks so much better than what we had before. So the next part is the rotation. So we rotated it on the X axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close everything off except for our X rotation, which we've got right here. And now what are we going to do with this rotation? First of all, the handle type should be free because I like to work in that fashion. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to do it like that. And if we move this like so, it's going to be very fast and then slowly coming back, falling back into its place just in time. So this can is done. Uh, right over here, we're going to press on this new one. I like to work in the timeline first, place my keyframes there and then go over to the graph editor. Just, just a preference. So what we want to have happen is that at the moment that this falls back to its original position, these ones should be on their position as well. So we're going to extend this to 54. Just so we have some breathing room that it can stand still. Uh, 
I like this faster version. It kind of swoops in. Whoopa. So yeah, frame 25 and 40 is where it's at. And back. All right, cool. So we do not have to change this. We can just set it to 50. Like so. Now it really swoops in. And as you might notice, once we're going to render this, we're going to add some motion blur and this will really sell the effect some more and will really make it look uh, better. So let's go over here and we've got that animation done. Now on this 40th frame, this and this should be on its final position. Location and rotation, location and rotation, both on the 40th frame. And now I'm going to frame zero, why not zero? Just going to pull it outward and rotate it somewhere. I don't really care where, something like that. Location and rotation. I'm going to, to do the same for this one. Uh, like so, location and rotation. And now it's slowly falling on the backside. Looks really weird. But what I want to have happen is that it falls like so and then whoop, slides in like this. And we can do that once again in the graph editor. So let's go ahead to our graph editor. I've got the right can selected right now. Let's see what it looks like. All right, pretty cool. Back into the modeling modus. And let's see, we are first going to work on the Z location because we're moving it upwards and downwards. Let's see what we can do. Maybe we can take this one and bring it inwards. It goes very slow. I do not like that. So I'm going to change the handle type to free, who would have guessed. I'm going to bring it down because I want it to fall faster first. Oh, and then it aligns into position. See what I'm meaning right there? Maybe this can go a little bit down. Okay, and slowly down and into the right position. So over here, I pretty much want the C location to be done already. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to drag this out some more, like this. And it falls and it slides into position. It falls and slides into position. That is exactly what we wanted. It's also moving on the Y axis. So I'm going over to the location of this can and on the Y location, I'm going to unlock it, press A, press Adopt. And now we can see our Y animation. Uh, the thing that's happening is it's going over here. We want it to be suspended in the air for a small period of time right over there. Uh, so what does that mean? It comes in falling quickly, shoop. Uh, then here it takes a little bit of a break and then it falls down into its original position in which it should really slide towards. First of all, what I'm going to do is around here. Uh, this is where I want the animation to occur. So I'm going to take this and add a location keyframe. Now I'm going to take this one and there you have it. I'm actually going to increase it on the X scale and then bring this one to this side, like so, G and X. So let's see what it does. Ah, there you go. And sweeping into position. But I really want it to slide from there on out. And right here, actually, we can move this a bit to the side. There you go. And now it's moving too fast. So I'm going to change this. And I'm going to change this one as well. Ah, there you go. And it's going into its position. All right, very cool. Uh, now, I probably want this can to be pretty much straight at the moment that it starts to speed up over here. And that is the X rotation. So we're going to look into that in a minute. So let's see if this is what we're looking for. I want it to slide some more on the ground. So maybe we can take the C location and have it occur a lot faster even. Take this one, GX. So that's starting to look very good. I'm going to turn it on and off, and now I'm heading over to our rotation. Uh, let's turn it all on, so everything should be locked. And now we have our X rotation, which is this one. 
I'm going to open it up, press A, press dot, and now we can see this animation. So what I want to have happen is that right over here when it starts sliding, it should probably already be nearly done with its, uh, with its rotation on the x-axis so that it becomes more straight. And the way we can do that is simply by taking this one, pressing G and X, and uh, bringing it to the left side. All right, shoof, shoof, yeah. Uh, maybe it can be a little bit slower. All right, let's see what it looks like in the modeling session. Nice. So this one is done. We can unlock everything so that we can move around the keyframes if we like to. Uh, go over to this one. So we already have our keyframes set and done. Once again, we're going over into the Z location. We're going to take that, press A, press dot, and lock everything except for the C location. So what do we want to have happen? First, it should fall quickly. And after it has fallen quickly, it should slide in position. So what do we remember? Uh, the steeper the hill, the faster it will be. So we're going to change the handle type to free, bring this down and make sure it's a steep hill, fall very quickly, uh, take the other can as a reference, like so. And now it's kind of falling into the right position. Maybe we can take this one, G and exit. All right, looking good. So now we can change uh, what location? This is the Y location. So close off the C, open up the Y, A dot on the Y location. And I'm seeing that it's already moving in a slightly unnatural fashion towards the side already. Uh, but we want this to end up slowly. So I'm going to take this and drag it like so. I'm going to turn it like so. There you go. So now it's first slowly going to that side and then speeding up towards our ending where it will slow down once again and slides into place. Yeah, pretty cool. But it's not on the ground at this moment that it speeds up. It's already speeding up in its fall. Uh, so what we should probably do is go back to the C location right over here. And right now it should already be a bit lower. So I'm going to take this one, G and C. There you go. Close it off, go back to the Y location, A, Y. Let's see what this looks like. And it's sliding in position. Maybe we can make it less drastic. That looks a little bit smoother. Uh, and now we want to change the X rotation. So let's open that one up and let's see what we've got. It is going into its final position already over here. But what if we take this one and actually this one and GX and make sure it's already a bit straighter. Ooh, that doesn't look good. Like so, and then over here, we should probably have a moment of pause and take this, rotate it like so, yes. Maybe this one can be a little bit more extreme. To the other side. All right, so this looks pretty cool. Sliding in, recovering its position, falling fast, sliding into position right here, slowing down at the very end. And this is actually the first animation that we've made for this product tutorial. I'm going to render it out and show you the final process. Maybe we can change uh, some little things that we do not like about it. Usually the first time is not the best time, but uh, we're going to find out. So let's see, I'm going into my render settings. I want to change the RGB to color depth 16. It just looks better, so I recommend doing that. I'm going to select a folder in which we can uh, place this. Product animation, I'm just going into my product free course, new folder. So this is product animation number one, slide in. I'm going over into the motion blur and enable it. And uh, I think it's going to look very cool. Let's set it to modeling mode because if you keep it to render mode, the render will be slower because it takes up computing time. So right over here, the render animation. Now, if your render is having trouble with the motion blur and showing all these black lines, there is a solution for this. However, it will increase your render time in this case. 
not in every case, but now it will. Uh, I actually use a GPU most of the time, but if you set it to CPU, the problem will be solved. So that is a small workaround that you can use if you are getting these harsh motion blur lines. Uh, I do not know how to fix this in the GPU settings still. I tried decreasing the shutter. I tried turning off the auto smooth and other common problems, but it doesn't work. So uh, this is the only solution I have right now. Just set it to CPU and render it again. So here uh, there was a black line at first so i'm going to show you and i already saw these black lines from the can falling and i was like hey what is this uh, but it is due to gpu and motion blur causing some issues anyway you can just render it using the cpu it will be a lot slower a whole lot slower but it will get the job done if you are having these problems and what you can also do is add a motion blur in your favorite editing program but i find that this is the best way to do it for now so i am just going to render it on cpu this looks very cool uh, there are a couple of things that i'd like to change though so first of all this symbol is not white while for the orange one it is white so i'm going to change this symbol to the white and right here we can see our droplets and i think they look pretty cool but they could be a slight bit bigger and besides that the only thing that i want to add is maybe a very very low density volumetric to give some air to this space because now it seems to be taking place in vacuum it's not really that annoying but i think it could be a little bit better by adding a volumetric Basically, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to improve this render. And I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm doing all of that extra stuff as well. So it's not like everything went perfect in the first try. And I have to make some adjustments and changes in order to get this the way that I want it to look. In this video, you'll learn how to make this scale pop-in effect. We're going to use the noise to randomize our animation. We're going to learn what an Outback Cubic is on the graph editor. And we're also going to animate the camera on a path. So without further ado, let's get started so this is our scene and we are going to make a pop in effect we're going to scale this down to zero then have it come back in and we're going to use like an outback cubic uh, motion that's the way it is called in davinci resolve but it's just it simply means that the graph overshoots a little bit uh, than the original keyframes we placed and then it goes back to the size that we want it to. So let's say we have 0% and 100%. It overshoots to 110% and then reverts back to 100%. And this makes it look like, it, like it's popping in. And I actually use this quite often in my videos as well, where I add text effects, for example. Anyway, we are going to place the camera right here because this is going to be the backdrop where everything is happening on. And now I'm going to take this can going over into the graph editor and as you can see we have everything locked which means that we cannot delete our keyframes when everything is locked so i'm going to unlock everything go back to the timeline go back to the timeline select all these keyframes make sure we're on the last one because i want it to be standing straight and delete all the keyframes now we're going to do the same for all the other cans a very simple process going into the graph editor making sure that everything is unlocked Going into the timeline, deleting all the keyframes. Going to press on zero. This is what our camera looks like. I'm going to take this can, rotate it around the X axis, the Y axis, and bring it closer to us simply by manipulating the location axis. And I think this is around the size that I want it to be in the final render. What I'm going to do is I like the white background setup that we've got over here. So I'm not actually going to change that. I'm just going to duplicate this light and bring it over here. So now we have some cool lighting on our can as well. And maybe we can do the same with this one and add it as well. Let's see what it does for us. This one doesn't add too much, but we're just going to leave it there. Maybe it will work better on the other cans. Now, for the animation, what do we want to do? We want to have this start from zero, go to 110%, and then go to 100%. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going over to frame 15, because I think that will be quick enough for us to use this animation. And I'm going to press I, location, rotation, and skill. And then on frame zero, I'm going to click on S, zero so i'm going to scale it down to zero why uh, i mean i location rotation and scale so now 
Yay, it's popping in. But it's very linear and it's very boring. So this is not the way that we want it to look. We want to go into the graph editor. And now I'm going to teach you about the Outback cubic method. So I'm going to lock all our areas except for the skill. So right here we can select the skill, press A, press a dot. And now you can see our Bessier curve, which we've talked about before. And now we're going to have this overshoot effect. Now, how are we going to do that? You probably already know, uh, but I'm going to click on this, change the handle type to free, because I want the effect to be faster when it comes in. So it comes popping in really fast and then it slows down. So we're going to take this handle, we're going to take, bring it upwards and let's see what that does for us. There you go. And it's, whoop, it's popping in, but it's not really giving the effect that we wanted yet. So I'm going to select all of this handle type free. And now I'm going to take this one and increase the overshoot. So let's see what this does. And now it goes back. So it's kind of like, whoop, and that is what we want to have. Uh, now I do think it is a bit slow. So what we can do is we're going to take this, place an extra keyframe over here, location, rotation and scale, and then change this handle type to free and increase the bounce even more. Because we actually want to follow this linear path as well that we've already set up. Very good. I'm going to take these two and move it closer. All right, so this is going to be our bouncy animation, our scale pop in. Maybe we can emphasize it just a little bit more. Maybe we can speed it up. I don't think so. Probably looks bad. Ah, it actually looks pretty cool. So this is the way the graph editor now looks. So it comes in quick. We've got that over here, it comes in quick. Then over here it overshoots, so it is going higher than our end frame. And then it goes back to our 100%, so to say. And this is what that looks like, it's popping in, very cool. But we have about 30 frames left and it would be very boring if this object would be standing still for the next 30 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I am going to add a rotation to this, have it wobble a little bit and then it will not be as boring as it is right now. And then we are going to add the other cans and have them pop pop in as well and add some rotation to those. And uh, then we're going to finalize the render and call it a day. So stick around, we're almost there. We are going to take this, set it to frame 50, make sure everything is unlocked. And now I am going to rotate it something like this, just something that might look cool, something like so. Maybe this, or maybe this. I think this could, could look cool. I, rotation. Let's see what that does for us. And as you can see, it just kind of goes over into the rotation without any smooth transitioning. So we're just going to lock the skill, lock the location. And I'm going to just select the X dot, and now we can see what it looks like. And we can also learn a new trick. So I'm going over here to the uh, pivot point and change it to individual centers. Then I'm going to press A and what this does is we can scale these keyframes from their own respective centers. So S, X, and now when you select this you can change the sharpness of the angle of our Bezier curve. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm going to use this or not, I just wanted to show you that little trick. Uh, I'm going to place it back on bounding box center. And what I've done is I've selected these keyframes. First they were like over here, but I am going to place them all the way on zero. Now what does this do? It makes sure that the rotation is already starting when it pops in. So now I'm going to close this one off and going to the Y rotation, I'm going to select it, click on it. I'm going to bring every keyframe to zero. And let's see what that does for us. And go to the set location and now do the exact same thing. But for this one, it's going to be to the left. 
And if you think it's rotating too far around, no problem. We are going to add some extra effects to the camera to make sure that we can make this seem real smooth and cool. The way we are going to do that is by adding a curved circle and cool stuff like that. But we're not doing that right now. First, we are going to take our other cans and make sure they pop in as well and have their specific location. Click on this timeline. And as I can see on frame 15, it has fully popped in. So it's not going back anymore. This is the way it looks. I'm not really sure about it slowing down. So I'm going back into the graph editor. I'm going to press on the X first dot and it's slowing down, but maybe I want it to come to a full stop. Ah, this looks a lot better already. Maybe we do not even have to change the other rotations, but I'm going to check anyway, because you never know. I'm going to take this one, select it, G. And now it doesn't slow down and it already looks a lot better. I'm going to take it on the C location as well. And maybe we can do it like this. I don't think this will do a lot, by the way. No, I'm not going to do this one. This one is fine. There you go. This looks a lot smoother. Uh, so on frame 15, our animation is done for this can. So what I want to have happen is that these other cans who do not have the main character focus, let's say, pop in at different times than this can. So I'm not going to have them all pop in at the same time. I'm going to make sure that there's a slight delay and our orange can comes popping in on the right and our blue can on the left and it's pop, pop. So we get pop, pop, pop. So let's go ahead and do that. G, X, G, Z, oh, G, Z. Now come closer, my friend. And for this one, I want the top to be a little bit visible because well, we didn't model it for nothing, right? Maybe something like this can be fine. Uh, I think it's a little bit dark. We can add an extra light and use light linking in order to only brighten up this one because I like the black can already, but the orange can now is underlit. So we need to add some extra lights, but I do not want extra lights on my black can. So later on in this tutorial, we are going to do some light linking and make sure it all looks good. So first of all, we are on frame 15, but I want this animation to be done on frame 24. Why not? 24. Location, rotation and scale. And then I'm going back to 10 frames earlier. How many frames did we take here? 15. So we're going to do the exact same thing. Nine. Scale it on zero. I, location, rotation and scale. And what will it do? Yes, exactly what we want it to do. So we're going over into the graph editor. This should be second nature to you by now. I hope that this free course is very helpful for you to understand the graph editor and to really see how you can manipulate those lines in order to get the animation that you want to have. And I hope uh, that I'm being very clear in this, in my explanation in how this works. So that you can become a great animator. Uh, we have the X location, Y location, Z location. Don't care about that. We only want to do the scale. So I'm going to set everything to lock, except for the scale. And I'm going to select all the scales and press on my dot. So right here, we have the scales. Now, by now, you know, we can change the handle type to free. And I'm going to take this upwards. And why do I do that? Well, because we want it to be very fast in the beginning and then slow down at the end. There you go, so that it's popping in very fast Chip. and slowing down. Now we need our overshoot. We do not have our overshoot yet. So I think right over here. So when we place this upwards, we get our overshoot. Choo. Bah. It's a bit slow. So I'm going to place a keyframe on the 15th. I location, rotation and scale. Bring this down, change the handle type to free and turn this up. No, I do not want it to pop. I think something like this should work out. It's too slow, way too slow. Let's take this, bring it up here. All right, so this is kind of what we want. I'm going to change this. Um, let's see, what if we do it like this? So this is the way that looks right now. And uh, it's just a lot of playing around, but we got the pop in animation and uh, that is all that counts. So it comes in very fast, as you can see from this line here. Then it scales up in the overshoot 
and then it goes back to the 100% that we want it to be the normal can size. So now that we've got that, we can go over to frame 50 and what do we do? We're going to unlock everything, take our rotation and maybe give it something like a rotation like so. I rotation. Then I'm going to lock everything except for the rotation. Select the X rotation and let's see what we've got. Now we probably have to take this, bring it back on to keyframe zero so that the animation rotation start. Okay. So that is unnatural. Uh, maybe we can change that by doing the same for our Y location and our C uh, as well. So let's see what that does. Ah, that looks pretty cool. So what about this? This is just playing around guys, let's check it out. Maybe we can have this go faster. Yeah, this looks a lot more natural, so I'm going to roll with this. So it comes in like, like so, and it does slow down in the end, but it looks better. So I'm going to roll with it. The I rotation as well. So let's try our uh, individual centers method. So I'm going to set it to individual centers right here. Scale on the X axis, maybe something like this. It looks pretty cool. So this one is done as well. And now we're going to animate the final can. And after we've got the animation of the can, we can animate our camera around it and make sure that the entire render looks cool. So first of all, going back to the timeline, and as you can see, these are our keyframes and uh, our blue can is hiding behind the other one. So we have to find him. There he is. Hello, blue can. Now we're clicking on zero. GX to bring it closer to us. GC to bring it upwards. GX, something like this. Well, maybe it would be cool if this kind of looked uh, like a lightning bolt and have it make this lightning shape. So let's see, this is frame 24 that it's ending on. So we're going over to, let's say frame 31. That means that it's location, rotation and scale right there. Uh, I think it took about 15 frames. So we're going to frame 16. S, zero, I, location, rotation and scale. Pop, 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 very good, pop, 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 yes. So now we can go back into the graph editor, take our can, lock everything except for the skill, select the skill, A dot, and now we've got our skill over here. We want it to come in very quickly, you remember. I'm just going to speed through this right now. Very quickly, boom. Yeah, so it comes in quick, shuts. Now we need our overshoot, so I'm going to place a keyframe right here. Location, rotation and skill. Select this, handle type, free, and turn it upwards like so. That's the one, and it kind of looks like uh, the other one as well, as you remember, so it looks like this. And this one looks like this as well. And now we have a cool pop in animation. Yay, very nice. So we're going to add the rotation once more. Go to frame 50. And let's see which way do we want to have this one rotate. I think like so. I rotation. Now we have a keyframe. Very good. Graph editor. Ah, there it is. So let's start out with the X. Going to take all of this and bring it to the front. All right. Uh, let's see what that does for us on the Y rotation as well. Let's bring it up. Let's bring it like somewhere over here. This pop, pop, pop. And it's moving around ever so slightly. Very good. Rotation. Going into the modifiers, you can select the modifier. And over here you can select noise. Now this is very noisy and you will see what this does. Brrr, our can is having a lot of fun there. So we can increase the skill, make sure that it's uh, yeah, a little bit softer, but it still wobbles around a lot. And uh, we do not want that, but this is an animation trick that you can use. You can add random noise to certain animations to make it seem way more complicated than it really is. So I'm going to change the strength to 0.1 and this will decrease the amplitude of our, our wave. I'm going to set it to like 0.01. Really subtle extra uh, animation on this. Now what you can do to copy this is you can copy the F modifier with this little button right here. Copy, go to the Y. Let's see what it does. So we've got our Y uh, right here. And then this is the paste button. And then it adds the same noise to the Y rotation. 
and now it's wobbling around just a little bit more. I'm going to keep it really subtle. I just wanted to show you this animation trick because it is uh, used very often also in hands and arms just to give it a little bit more motion and make it seem a lot more real than a statically animated shot. So this is something that you can do, play around with it. It's a lot of fun and uh, use the noise texture, increase the strength or, and the skill, uh, which is the frequency and the amplitude and uh, have some fun with it. Either way, this is now the ending of our animation of cans, but we have done nothing for our camera. And that is what we are going to do. So I'm going over into the timeline. I'm going to select the camera. And in the end, we will do some extra lighting tricks. Don't worry about it. But now we're going to select the camera and I want this to be the final frame. And I'm going to increase the final frame afterwards because I'm going to do a pan whip. Oftentimes what people do not realize when they make animations is that you have to make transitions in between the shots. And for that reason, it is very good to know what kind of shots you're already going to make and have them transition over into each other. And I've already thought it out for you guys in this uh, product animation free course, so you do not have to think about it right now. But do keep that in mind when you are making your own product animations, you already know that it's going to click like puzzle pieces together uh, in the final product instead of having just some random shots over here, random shots over there. I'm going to add a new camera. Camera. Then over here, view, cameras, set active object as camera. And now we have a new camera. I'm going to place my 3D cursor right here. I'm going to go to curve, circle. Right now we've got a circle. And I'm going to press on my camera. And over here in the constraints tab, we can set a fellow follow path constraint right here and then select our Bessier circle. It's kind of not on our circle. And the reason for this is because the camera has a transformation location. So we have to change the location to zero. You can press on N on the keyboard. This will pop up the little window. And now you can set the location to zero. Our camera, as you can see, is located on our circle. I'm going to make it smaller, by the way, so you can uh, view what it actually looks like. doesn't matter if you scale the camera, by the way. It doesn't do anything for you. Uh, as you can see, it doesn't do anything. It's not uh, centered on the objects that we want it to be centered to. So we're going to add another object constraint. It's going to be the track to constraint. Now, when I use this little eyedropper and select our cylinder, which is our main can, then the camera is going to be aligned to that can at all times. Now, here in our follow path, I'm going to close this, we do not need it anymore. In our follow path, we can change the offset and our camera will move on our circle. Like so. And that is exactly what we want. So first of all, I'm going to rotate the circle on different axes to kind of get the same result at which we ended at. Scale it down. So this was the animation that I was going for. Uh, so right here, I'm going to location, rotation and scale on this curve. So not on the camera, on the curve. Because maybe I want to animate the curve later. And then I'm going into the camera, rotate it like from here. Because this one pops in first. And then right over here, this one pops in. And that is a great way to showcase that. So I'm going to make sure that we're in the white part right over here. I, uh, uh, this is where we are beginning, by the way. So I'm going to set this to frame zero. And this is where I want my animation to end. A keyframe somewhere in the middle or somewhere around frame 35. Place a new keyframe on this offset. And why do we do that? Now I can take these keyframes and move them closer so the camera moves fast and then slows down. That's what we want. There you go. And it kind of gives this slow motion effect. And the camera is just going to keep going. Uh, not entirely though, because it's a Bessier curve, so it comes to a slow halt at the end, as you know by now. So we have to go into the follow path in the graph editor, graph editor, select it. Let's see what it looks like. And as you can see, it's already slowing down here very fast. And we do not want that. So I'm going to make it a little bit more linear. Very cool. There you go. 
And now it's moving all the way until the end. And that's exactly what we wanted to have happen. So we're just going to leave uh, the curve untouched. And I think this camera move is enough for us to make it look cool. So, uh, let's see. Is there anything I would like to change? I'm not liking that we can see the line of our area light right here. Uh, which one is it? I'm going to take it and place it backwards to make sure that this is looking clean. So I'm going to add an extra area lamp. Area lamp. I do not want the light to fall on all of these cans, but maybe just on the orange one. I'm going into the object properties right over here. Shading, light linking, new. I could have been more specific in my naming of these cans, uh, but for now I am just going to drag the cylinder 001 into my light linking area. And as you can see, all of these other objects are excluded from the lighting. Uh, so I'm going to select area 009 and maybe bring it upwards like so and turn it off, turn it on. And this looks a lot better in my opinion. So now it's very dark, now it's a bit lighter and it looks very cool. And that's what we want. These droplets could be a little bit bigger. I see that I did not place a scale in the uh, geometry nodes modifier. So I'm going to change that right now. Going over to geometry nodes right here. We have our from min and to max. So I'm going to the to max and I'm going to change this to 0 0.003. And now it's just a little bit bigger, maybe 0 0.034. And now it's just a bit bigger and we can play around with that. These ones are also pretty small, so 0 0.036. Let's randomize it, why not? And now all of these cans have their bubbles and droplets. Uh, so basically what we've got right now is our entire animation. It's popping in, pop, pop, pop. I do not like the fact that it's already slowing down when the blue one is still popping in. So I'm going to select this keyframe, bring it over here. No, do not like that. Maybe something like this. Oh, I kind of like that. Shoof, shoof. So it's moving around. Shoof, 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 shoof. And so it's moving very fast right here. Then it's slowing down and it's moving very fast again. Coming to a halt and slowly fizzling out. I think I'm just going to test it. And if it looks good, I'm going to keep it. If it doesn't look good, my bad. You gotta do it again. No matter what you do with your animation, just make sure it looks cool. I think I've taught you the basics on how to do this. I am still doubting whether I should use this uh, camera effect or just have it go over into the slow motion like we had before. I'm going to leave it like this for now and I'll decide later on. First, I am going to the 50th frame because this is the end frame. Everything stops moving right here. I am going 10 frames in the future, which is on frame 60. And now I'm going to uh, animate the camera going upward really fast. And using the slow motion, it will make sure that we get some blurred lines. And then we are going to start the next animation going upwards as well. Then we can transition them seamlessly between each other. The circle, it already has a keyframe on frame 50. Problem is that it is of course tracked to this object. So we have to go into the camera to the constraints and right here we have our influence which means that if I take this it is not influenced by the can at all and I want the influence here to be 1 and here to be 0 oh that's going very fast place this on frame 60 now it's going up Maybe we can increase the size of this so we can go even higher. Higher, yeah. So let's see what that did for us. Yeah, yeah. And going upwards, very cool. And that is 60 frames. So I'm going to change this to 60 frames. Now we're going to create a new folder for this. Pop in animation, just going to call it that. And I think uh, we can try to use the GPU once again. The motion blur did some weird and funky stuff in the previous one, but I hope it will not do that right now. Uh, right over here, I think we have some motion blur. So let's check it out on this frame. Ah, and it's messing up our motion blur once again. So this was the problem I was talking about before. We cannot use this, pretty much garbage. So we have to set it to CPU, 
CPU. And I'm going to change the max samples to 128 because it's just a lot faster like that. 0.01 for the noise threshold. Let's render it out. Transitions in your render are very important to maintain a good flow throughout the video. In this video, we'll make a simple wipe transition where the can will hide our hard cut. So let's do it. We're going to remove all of this, all of these animations. We're going to make a can that slides across the screen. The reason for it is because we want to transition between the shots and we can do that by sliding the separate can over the screen and hide our cut. Uh, let's get started. This is uh, the blender scene which we're working in. Select this curve circle and I'm going to delete it. Uh, and by the way, I've made a different save. So uh, I called it a new animation and I am working in a different project file right now. So don't delete everything just yet because you might want to adjust some things in the future. Here we've got our camera and I'm going to go to the constraints and delete all of those as well. I'm going to delete the keyframes and right now I'm going to delete this camera as well. Going back to the timeline, selecting this, delete it, selecting this, delete it, selecting this, delete it. And now I'm going over and make this one straight by pressing Alt R. These ones we do not need for now, so I'm just going to place it on the side. And I'm going to press on three, position our camera, bring it forward and make sure that it is in our lighting setup. So right now I'm going to take this can and it should cover the entire screen. So we probably should have to bring it closer. Let's see in render mode what we have got. It is rotated and I actually want it to be straight like so. Bring this over very close, something like this. Bring the camera down. So something like this, it should cover the entire screen. Maybe we can take both of those and move on the X axis so that it is placed in our lighting setup, which looks just a little bit better. We only want this to be 12 frames. So I'm going to set this to 12, going to frame zero and it kind of rotated just now and I'm not sure why, but I'm just going to do it again like this. Oh, there are some keyframes here. Just going to delete those. And now this will stick as it is. So first of all, on frame one, we want this to be over here, right outside of frame. I'm going to place a location, rotation and scale keyframe. And then for frame 12, we want it to be on the other side, having crossed the entire camera, location, rotation and scale. And right now what we've got is this. So it's going over to the other side. And I think this already looks pretty good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the plane and turn it off for now, also in the render view, turn it off. Let's see what that looks like. I'm going to set this to film transparent. It's just going to swipe over the screen so that we can hide our cut and go over to the next shot. Simple as that. So I'm going over here, I'm going to create a new folder. So this is the can transition swipe, name it accordingly, can transition swipe. So I'm going to render this out and that's it for this tutorial. It was a very quick one. So I'll see you in the next part of this free course. In this part of the free masterclass, we're going to animate one of my signature moves. I like using this animation because it's very energetic and beautiful. You're going to learn a lot, so buckle up and let's animate. And by the way, maybe we can call this the ender animation. All right, so if you followed the previous part of this free course, we have made our transition with the can going over the screen. And now I'm going to bring back my plane. We're going to make another animation that I also used in my default cube video that a lot of people seem to love. Place this can on the ground of our plane. And I'm going to bring the camera down. I'm going to slide it backwards. And let's see what this looks like for now. I'm going to use the several techniques that we've already learned in the previous parts. We're going to make a pop-in effect, have it skew over to the side. Then another one comes rolling in, but this time we are going to rotate it on the Z axis as well. We are going to alternate that. It pops in from this side, then something comes rolling in, then it pops in from this side, something comes rolling in. And in that fashion, it will look very smooth. We are going to animate the camera backwards until finally the can is fully in the camera. And we are going to transition, use that last frame as the first frame of our next animation. But I'll dive into that later in this video. First, we are going to make those animations. We've already got our plane set up, we've got our lighting, so we do not have to do anything fancy to get that to look right. I'm going to grab my other two bottles right over there. I'm going to press Alt R to remove the rotation and I'm going to place it over here. This one will already be standing in its location. Bring it backwards somewhere over here. 
and we've got our 60 frames. Now, I want to make this band whip seven frames. How do I know that? I am already playing around in the edit with the other shots that I've got. And I, I literally just counted how many frames until the beat hits. And at that point, I want this camera to be standing still on this frame. So I'm going to use seven frames for the band whip, which is right over here. Seven, seven frames. Select the camera. And this is where we want to have it end. And now I'm going back to frame zero. I'm going to press RXX to scale it upon its, uh, I mean, rotate it. And I'm going to bring it down like so. Location and rotation. And now it moves upwards and comes to a stop where we want it to begin. And our plane is not long enough. We're going to move the camera backwards. I'm going to take this, press G and X and make this longer. Uh, I want this to be a little bit closer. I think it's too far away, right over here. And I want this can to land in front of this can. So I'm going to delete the keyframes. So let me work in modeling mode for now. Alt-R, going to set it exactly on the plane, like this. Now I'm going to bring it forward and make sure that it's in a straight line, like so. Now it's probably not in the correct rotation. So I'm going to change the rotation and make sure that it shows our logo like this. So this is the end frame for our uh, orange bottle. Now, as you can see, the lighting is not very spectacular right over here, but we're going to change that later on. First, we're going to get the animation right, then we'll do the lighting and make sure everything looks cool. I want to move this to approximately frame 17 and make it a duration of 10 frames, which is half a second. I like when it pops in quite quickly instead of slowly, because then you can see what is happening. You do not want to see what's happening. It must look like magic. Right over here, I'm going to press location, rotation and skill by pressing I and adding a keyframe. I'm going back to frame seven. From the camera view, I am going to watch this, bring it upwards, slightly backwards, rotate it, S zero, I, location and rotation and scale. So what's happening, it's going to up into existence. And then what we want to have happen is that it falls over to the side just a little bit. I'm going in, let's say 22, frame 22, which is about five frames further. I'm going to select this edge, shift S, cursor to select it, and change this to our 3D cursor, pivot point, R, X, and rotate it like so. Add a rotation keyframe, it doesn't work. So why doesn't it work? Well, probably location, rotation, and scale. Yeah. So location, rotation, and scale. And now it's going to the side. And then I'm going to select this keyframe and copy it on frame 27. So now it is pop, pop. The way where it's coming from is not entirely where I want it to be. So I'm going to place it somewhere over here. Location, rotation, and scale, pop. And that looks already a lot better. So now it's coming into existence and we are going to change the animation with the graph editor once again. So going over into the object properties, first of all, we want to do the skill. So I'm going to lock everything, unlock the skill, select all these skills, go over here and press dot. And now we have our skill right over here. Now I want it to be very fast in the beginning and you can already think for yourself, how can I do that? Well, it's going to be this figure again. Scaling in a lot faster, pop, and it pops into existence, pop, very cool. Now I'm going into the rotation. I kind of like the way the location is handled already. So I'm going to leave the location locked, open up our rotation, go to the X rotation and pop, looks pretty good. The Y rotation is the one that we are going to be needing, pop, like so. Maybe we can increase it like such. So it's going like this, and then it's skewing over to the side right here. I'm going to make this one free and have it be papa. Very cool. This one could be a little bit to the side. Now I'm going to try and do the same for the Z rotation. Is there any Z rotation even? So first let's see what this does. I'm going to place this on individual centers, scale it on the x-axis. And this one should be slower. 
and have a look at that one. So the X location is looking like this. Let's see what we can do with it. Change the handle type to free, bring it upwards. So don't worry too much about this animation. We're going to obscure everything and uh, by rotating this one in while this one is still wobbling. So the end of the wobble doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't really matter that much. So I'm going to take this one, uh, going over into the timeline, delete these keyframes that we still have left, Alt-R, go on to 7, make sure that it is going to stand in the same line that we want it to have happen in. Now bring it down, make sure that it's properly aligned to the plane, like so. And this is where we want to have it end straight away when this one is still wobbling. So this seems like the right location. When, it all, when this one lands, this one should be in its location already. Location, rotation and scale, let's say 12. I think 10 frames is going to be fine. Then we're going to bring this to the side and rotate it on its own axis. So change this pivot point to median. And let's see, I'm going to rotate it from this side, I, location, rotation, and scale. And now it is located like that. And I don't think frame 12 is the best one to start at. So we're going to uh, have this one entirely on frame 24-ish. So 24. Yes. So now I'm going over into the graph editor. By the way, it's on frame, well, 10, and then on frame 24. So it's 14 frames, which is not even a second because a second is 24 frames. I'm going into the graph editor and here I'm going to open up our location. Well, we actually changed the location on the Y axis. So I'm going to close everything except for the Y location. Now, what do I want to have happen? I want it to come in quick, and then as it slides, because of the friction, it will slow down. So how do we do that? I think by now you already know. We're going to free this handle up, make sure it has the freedom to move around. Now I'm going to bring this upwards and create this type of shape. So now it comes in quickly and slows down. Very cool. Then the other thing we need to do is change the C rotation. And those are basically the only things we have for this uh, specific render. So now uh, I want this to slow down over here. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to drag this one out. And maybe it's a little bit too fast. So I'm going to drag this one out as well towards this side. Still too fast. I want it to slow down a lot quicker. So maybe we can do it like this. There you go. And now it's sliding into position slowly but surely. Maybe we can even make it a little bit less steep. No, I think this is the right way to do it. Maybe we can even drag it a bit more to the side. All right, so now this animation is done as well. It's sliding in the front while the other one is still falling. And that's why that final animation of the previous one doesn't really matter. Like this. I do think it is happening a bit too quickly. So I'm going over into the timeline, bring it over here, and change the entire scale of this to frame 30. Yes, so now we can see the wobble, and it's going into, sliding into frame. Very good. I'm going to duplicate this one, bring it forward, Right now we are going to make the scale come from the left side and then the slide from the right side and then we'll add our final can, which will be our transition can. Now I'm going to delete all the keyframes that it has. It shouldn't be moving anymore. I think we can use frame 30 to have it uh, stand here. Go over here, select this edge, cursor to select it by pressing shift S, press on zero. And now we can go over to this side, set this to median point and move this over, rotate it in whatever fashion you like. S, zero, I, location, rotation, and scale. And then maybe we can place it a little bit higher. There you go. Now I'm going to set the pivot point to 3D cursor. R, X, move it like this, location, rotation, and scale. And up, it's going like that. Then we're going to take this keyframe and place it back. And now we've got our animation ready for the graph editor. So we're going into the graph editor, going to lock everything except for the scale. I'm going to select the scale and let's have a look at where our scale is located. Now, you know what I want to do. I want it to come popping in very fast. 
I'm going to change the handle type to free. I'm going to take this handle and bring it upwards like so. Pop. Pop. Very good. Now I think the C location is a little bit slow, so I'm going into the C location. And I'm going to take this handle, change it to free, and make sure that it falls down very quickly. Papa. Now I'm going to leave it like that. Uh, I think that animation is fine. Now for the graph editor, I am going to unlock everything. I want to add one more because we've got a, a pop in, a slide, a pop in, and now we want another slide. So this slide came from this side, so the other one should come from this side. And then we will add our final uh, bottle. I am going to take this sliding one, duplicate it, and bring it forward like so. And now I want to delete the keyframes, which I'm going to do, and it shouldn't move around anymore. So this one is popping into existence, and right here I want the slide animation to be done. So I'm going to select the location, rotation, and scale, go back around, let's see, 12 frames, and have it move from this side, and set the pivot point to median, RC, and let's have it rotate. Yes, very good. So we're going into the graph editor. Now I'm going over to the, which location was this? The Y location. I'm going to close everything except for the Y location. And I want it to start fast and slow down because that's how friction works. So I'm going to make this handle very quickly at the beginning, like this. And that looks pretty smooth. Now, going into the C Euler rotation. I'm going to select that. And maybe we want this to happen quickly and then slow down as well. Why not? There you go. Very nice. So this already looks pretty good. And now for the final uh, can, we can probably just take this one uh, because I want it to be the black can once again, or original can. Duplicate it, bring it over here. It has no keyframes, so there's nothing going on. And I want to have it end exactly at this point. And for the final, animation i think we could have it come popping in from the top uh, this is on frame 45 I'm going to frame 35 i'm going to place it upwards maybe give it a slight angle s zero i location and rotation and now it pops into existence like that now first things first i am going to take the camera i think we are a bit too far so we should probably start closer and then move backwards I'm going to delete these keyframes, I'm going forward, like right over here, and on frame 7, we should be there, and on frame 1, uh, RXX, and we can change it like this. Uh, I'm going to place it like so, and it's going up, then we have the animations happening, and what we want to do is have it go backward for the entirety of 48 frames, which is 2 seconds. And I'm going to place it backwards, like so, until we've reached our final destination. Right there. And this is going to be a match cut. And we are going to do that later on. But this is what it looks like right now. So we can do the graph editor of this pop-in. So let's go to the scale. Let's grab the scale. I already know what I want to do. I'm going to set it to free. I want it to pop in quicker. And pop. And it pops in like that. Pop. So right here on frame 48, we are done. And maybe the camera move can be a lot smoother. So let's go into the camera and go to the graph editor. We are moving this on the X location. So I'm going to lock everything except for the X location. And let's see what we can do with this. We can change the handle type to free. And now maybe we can move it like this. Like that. Pop, pop, pop. Now the only thing I am having problems with is that this one is a bit too slow. So we are going to in the timeline and move it. And now we have to change our locks, of course, as always. Go into the timeline and move it backwards. So now it falls in at the right time. So I'm going to set it to frame 41 at which it ends. Pop. And then we're just going to have it play out like that. And that's a two second animation. It looks like this. Pop, pop, pop. Pop, pop, pop. Pop, pop, pop. Very cool. Very cool looking. Uh, now, one thing we should do is probably change the colors of some of these and because they are all blue. So what I'm going to do is I'm heading over to Canva Color Wheel. 
And in the Canva color wheel, I am going to set this to tetradic and I have used blue and orange. So I'm going to set it to blue and orange. And as you can see, a certain type of pink color and green color will fit nicely in this scene and will be a logical color to have. So we are going into the shader editor, copy it by clicking on this copy button. Then right over here, we can change the color of our bottle. I'm going to make this one uh, like the purplish or pinkish color. Then I'm going to select this one. Let's have it duplicate it, change it to green. And let's see what that looks like. Pop, 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 chats. And it's very fast, pop, pop, pop. It might be too fast. And if that is the case, select all the keyframes at once then scale it twice. So if I just grab this one, for example, the final part, S2, it will scale it by two and it will be a lot slower. But I am going to have to judge that after viewing the render because I like fast renders. Bam, 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 very cool. Now, the only thing left that we should do is add some more lighting. I am not going to overcomplicate this at all. I am simply going to take this one and this one and bring it over here. Turn those off. Yes, as you can see, it's quite dark now. But then when we turn this on, we get a nice looking light on our cans. This animation looks really slick and I call it the camera pendulum animation. It's very easy to set up. So I'm adding an extra twist where we change the colors of the cans during the motion. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, everybody. So today we are going to create the easiest animation of this entire tutorial. It's going to be very simple. As I already told you, we are going to have this end frame be our start frame for the next animation. So right here, we've got this render. I'm going to save it as our new render. First of all, I will select all the objects in the scene. Then I'm going over to the graph editor, make sure that all our locks are unlocked so that we can delete the keyframes. Now, that seems to be the case. So right now I can select everything by pressing A, X to delete the keyframes on this very last frame and nothing should move from here on out. So I'm heading over into the camera and I'm going to press location, rotation and scale. And it will have its very first keyframe. So the camera is first going like this, swinging this side and then swinging back on that side. Heading over to frame 24, and I'm going to press R, Z, Z, and have the camera rotate on this axis like so. I, location, rotation, and skill. And then on frame 37, and what I'm doing is I'm using the frames that I have left on my music as a guideline. And I know that there will be a beat drop in 37 frames from our previous animation. Actually, it's 39 frames, but I tested some things around and I found that when I take two frames off, it looks best in the transition. I will swing the camera back to the other side. So R, C, Z to rotate it on its normal axis and something like this. And that is basically our animation and it's going very fast. And that's because this should not be on frame 24. This should be in the middle. So I'm going to place it at like 19. And that is the animation. Now, naturally, as you know from this course, we will have to do some things in the graph editor, which is what we'll do right now. So I'm heading over into the graph editor, clicking on my camera and let's see where my keyframes are. Where are my keyframes? Open this up. As we can see, we are doing something with this green line, which is this Y Euler rotation is going to be locked. And I'm opening up the Y Euler rotation, press A, press dot. And now we have our fine looking curve right here. Now, the way that I want this curve to look is parabolic. Uh, I want this to be a swinging effect and make it extra smooth. So I'm going to make both of these free. And this one I'm going to place upwards. And this one I'm going to place upwards as well. And let's see what that looks like. So now it's slowing down and fast. Slowing down fast, fast in the beginning. Maybe we can take this one and move it to this side. Maybe it could be a little bit And now it's kind of coming in faster, slowing down and like a pendulum swings back. And right here is our cut basically. So we are going to cut it right here and it will transition really nice. 
because it's going very fast. Oh, and we're going to cut on the action and you will not be able to see the jankiness of it. As you can see right now when I do this, it seems like it's running into a rock, but that is not going to be the case when we switch this to a different shot. It will actually look very smooth. So what are we going to do? Because this is not the end of our tutorial. I want to change the colors in between this animation because there's a hi-hat in the song. Ch -ch -ch -ch. And you can hear that. And I want the colors to change somewhere around those hi-hats. And so I'm going to render the same can in different colors. And I'll show you how to do that. But first, we need to render this one. So I'm going over here and I'm going to make a new folder. And I'm going to call it Black Color Rotation animation. I like long terms. Our color depth is on 16. That is looking fine. I'm going to set this to GPU because I've tested this out and it works on GPU now. Yay. So motion blur should be turned on. I believe we can increase the max samples to 1024. I'm just going to increase the noise threshold to 0.1. And as soon as this animation is done, I will show you what we have. And then we are going back into the render. We're going to change the colors, render the same animation multiple times. And then we're going to have that line up in the editing process, which is one of the final videos of this free course. All right, so now all we have to do is we go into this render. I'm going to click on this texture. And right here in the shader editor, I'm going to press on this uh, copy icon. And right in between this node and the principal BSDF, do mind the bottom principal BSDF, I am going to press Shift A, mix color, and let's see what we are doing. So right now it's giving this white haze because it's mixing our original image with this color B. I want to change the color to one of those colors. So let's say I am going to start with green. And then maybe I can take this green color and use the hex value. You can find the hex values right over there. And I'm going to copy it, add it over to this one. And then in color A actually, okay, let me just show you. I will make this green. Right now the entire can becomes green, but it's not the type of green that we want it to be. Reason for it is that we need to plug this into the factor as well. Why is that? Well, because it's mixing our previous image and thus the blacks with the green. I do not want that to happen. So I'm going to plug this color into the factor. Then I'm going to shift this one over to color B. And I'm going to change this color to green. And now everything is correct. Uh, one thing I am noticing, this is blue still and I want to make that white. So I'm going to RGB, I mean HSP. Value all the way to one, saturation all the way to zero. And now this is white as well. I'm going to add a new folder right over here. And we have the black color animation. So now a new folder. This is the green color rotation animation. And now you can make as many color renders as you like. And we will edit this together in the final part. You're going to learn how to make a liquid simulation in Blender. We're going to talk about setting it up and how it works. Do keep in mind that liquid simulations are a very slow and boring process, but sometimes we need them. So without further ado, Let's get started. All right, guys, so we are going to make a liquid simulation today. And right now I am going into this file, save as and create a new file for us to work in. First of all, unlock everything because I want to delete the keyframes on my camera. And by the way, you can hop into any render that we've done. It doesn't matter which render you pick, as long as you've got the bottle that you want the liquid simulation to happen on. For me, that will be the black bottle. So right now I'm going to select all of this and Delete it. Now, one thing that I said at the beginning of this masterclass is the dimensions should be at the proper scale because our depth of field will be uh, more accurate, etc. But right now for the liquid simulation, we actually do not want it to be on the proper scale. Reason for it, liquid simulations have a very hard time calculating what they should do when the object is too small. We are going to scale this up uh, as 10 first, and now it's one and a half meters, so as eight or no, as seven. So now it's 10 meters, and I think this is the accurate way that we can make a liquid simulation. Right now I'm going to scale up our backdrop as well, and maybe press on three. Place our camera by holding Control, Alt, and pressing zero. Bringing this down to the bottom of our can. I'm going to scale it on the Y axis and scale it some more. 
so on the x-axis as well, and maybe on the z-axis. Of course, our lighting will not be proportional anymore because lighting has something to do with the distance and the strength. So for very large objects, a uh, low wattage, 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 a low watt strength is not capable of giving us enough light, as you can see right here. So it doesn't matter for now because I am going to delete all the area lamps we have. And now it's gone. Now I'm using uh, an add-on called Easy HDRI. What you can do is you can go over to this world tab. You can click on the color, go to environment texture, and there you can add in your HDRI. But I'm going to use this free add-on going into my downloads folder, which is where I keep all my EXR files, fix world nodes. And right now we have some lighting to work with. It's very strong, so I'm going to change it to this one. And now it looks good. On to the liquid simulation. So that was pretty much the entire intro. We've got everything set up. This doesn't have any keyframes or whatever. We have our white backplate and our can and everything is looking fine and dandy. So liquid simulations. There are a couple of things you need to know. So first of all, uh, liquid simulation has to take place into a domain, which is uh, what I'm going to make right now. Uh, but first, let's make sure that our bottle is actually at the bottom of our plane. So right now it's aligned perfectly. I can go over here, select this edge, shift cursor to select it. And now I'm going to bring our cube down. Oh, where's our cube? There it is. And right now I'm going to bring this down and make sure that it's on the plane as well. Now I'm going to set the pivot point to 3D cursor like so and scale this up. Now go into the camera and make sure that it is covering the entire T of our scene. And this also includes the back plane. And because we have perspective in our camera, it is not an orthogonal camera, we can see the back lines. So you must make sure that you can also not see these back lines in the camera view. Uh, the way we can do that is by going over here and changing our viewport display to wire. Going into modeling mode. And as you can see, we have the wire. I actually placed it quite perfectly on this edge but not on this edge. So I'm going to scale it some more on the Y axis. And now everything is within our scene, uh, scale it a little bit more on the X axis. So this is what we want to have for our setup. This is going to be our domain. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scale it up just some more because I need some space on the back here because that's where we are going to be projecting our fluid simulation from. Now there are a couple of ways to do this and I'm going through them one by one because I do not want this to be a tutorial like, oh, just click on this and click on that. I want to actually show you guys how the liquid simulation actually functions and how we can make sure that in each and other render that we are going to do in the future, that it looks good. First of all, the domain. I'm going into this tab right here, which is the physics tab, and I'm going to click on fluid. The type should be a domain and automatically it's set to gas. It always does that, so change it to liquid. Now we cannot see anything anymore. And for that reason, we need to go into the visibility again. And under the viewport display, it's set to solid and I'm going to change it to bounce. Now, the first thing that you want to know, this is a little cube right here in the corner and it determines the resolution of our liquid sim. So let me explain 64 and it will make the cube smaller. So this is basically like a ratio to how many cubes will fit into this scene. And the more little cubes you have, the more calculations it will do and the more precise your liquid simulation will be. So that's what the little cube is for, just in case you're wondering. So here we have our can and we're not going to do anything with it right now. I'm simply going to add a plane. I think planes are the easiest way to do this. And we can change our pivot point back to median point. And I feel like I'm a bit hunched over, so I'm scoofing up like so. And I want to have correct posture for you guys so you do not get into these bad habits. Right now, we are hiding our plane behind our can. I want to give this a fluid simulation and set it to flow. And I'm going to set the smoke type to liquid, uh, the flow type to liquid. So flow behavior is from geometry. Uh, which means that it will be projected from this geometry. Now, uh, this doesn't have any geometry as of yet uh, because it is a plane. It does not have any actual depth in the scene. So what are we going to do? Uh, the flow source is the mesh. I'm actually just going to show you. So let's select our domain. Let's go over here, right here in the properties tab. I'm going to set it to 32. 
just for uh, demonstration purposes. Now, one thing that we want to have in our liquid simulation is very simple. We want to set this to modular and click is resumable. Now, the reason for that is that when you press on replay, you can kind of play around like this and it will try to give you the liquid simulation in real time. Then it will be baked in the cache automatically. It can kind of freeze up your computer. I do not like this way of working. By the way, if you do like this way of working, you can do that. Uh, but each time that you make a change, you have to change the resolution division to 33 or just one higher and then 32 back again. And then it will reset the cache. But in this tutorial, we are going to use modular, which means that we can add to it and bake different parts of the liquid simulation at separate times. We can stop it and re uh, resume it because it is resumable. That's why we clicked this little button right here. This start and end frame is how long the simulation will take place. And I'm going to set this to, let's say, 200 frames. 200 frames is pretty long, it's 10 seconds. And I definitely do not want it to be 10 seconds, but sometimes it needs some uh, Time to start. We are just going to cut it out in the editing part of this masterclass. So going to set this cache to 200 and I will show you right now by going over here we can bake data. I'm just going to bake the data and what does it do? Well nothing exactly as I predicted because this does not have any geometry really. From a plane nothing is emitted simply because we added it to a liquid simulation. Uh, the flow source is a mesh. This is okay. The surface emission will actually show you how much water uh, will be coming from our geometry. So let's say we add a surface emission of 10. I'm just going to add 10. I'm going into this plane and we can add initial velocity. So we've actually given it something to work with, namely the surface emission. This makes sure that there is something emitted from our surface, which is the plane. And the initial velocity will determine where things will be going. So what I'm going to do in order to make this more visible is I'm going to decrease the gravity because the gravity makes sure that everything falls down. Uh, so I'm heading over into the baked data once again and I will show you what happens. So as you can see, it is slowly emitting it towards this place. And it's very slow and we can increase that speed by a whole lot normal to 100 and let's bake it again. All right, so as you can see now, uh, the normal makes sure that it is emitted from our plane and it shoots it towards that side. Uh, one thing that you should know, it is emitting it from the vertices and not necessarily from the middle of the plane, just so you know. And now if we were to bake this into a mesh, let's just do that real quick. You will be able to see that if we change this back to a solid, it has turned the particle system into a fluid. And this is exactly what we want. Now, of course, it's going through our can, which is not what we want. But with these basics, we kind of understand what we need to do. We have our plane, and we can use any object we like, by the way. But we have our plane, and it emits particles from it. And these particles can be turned into a mesh, which is our fluid. And this fluid needs to interact with our can. How are we going to do that? We have our can right over here and we can press on this can at a fluid simulation type a factor because this means that it will interact with the liquid that we've added. You can pretty much set everything to default. It doesn't really matter that much. It does a pretty good job uh, while doing nothing. So let's keep it like that and rebake it so I can show you what it does. Rebake it, bake data. So right now, what does it look like? Change it to solid. And it's interacting with our can. So it's not going through the can anymore. It is kind of bouncing out against it, which is why it creates this cool splash. And that is exactly what we want. Now, this is not the type of splash that we want it to look like. Uh, I'm going to change it back to bounce. I'm going to delete all the bakes. Don't play around with this too much because if you use 64, it will not look like the one that you do in higher resolution. What I'm going to do actually is I'm going to change this to 128 just for example, because uh, it's so slow and sometimes it takes a long time to reach the can for some, ex uh, for some reason. And the way this works actually is because of this little cube right here. So it was a lot faster when we had big blobs, but we also got some big blobs in our mesh eventually, which doesn't look too good if you ask me. Uh, but now that it's a smaller cube that is calculating, it doesn't reach our can as quickly and you will actually find that there's a lot less water when we are working with this in a higher resolution division. So this particle system is heading 
towards our can. Doesn't seem like uh, like it had any hurry in doing so. We're going to free this data to uh, the source is actually the movement of the can when you kind of move it yourself like this. And then you have the animation going and the source will make it go like that. So we do not need the source. But the normal can only go to 100 and no more. So that is a problem. I'm heading over to the plane. And I'm, first of all, I'm placing it closer to this can. And now I can see it's moving on the x-axis. I'm going to move it on the x-axis and give it an initial velocity of around 40 meters per second. Then I'm selecting my domain. Bake the data. And now I hope this will speed up our particle system and make sure it hits our can. Uh, now one warning about liquid simulations, because uh, I need to be honest about this. This is not something that you can just do. Oh, let me let me do a nice liquid simulation today. Ho ho ho. No, this is something that will cost a lot of time. You have to do a lot of reiterations. Uh, you have to change settings all the time. And then you're waiting for a bake and all those annoying things. I do not like working with liquid simulations to be honest because it's too slow for my liking i like to work fast i like to have things done quickly but i do love the result that it gives us and so it is a necessary evil that looks pretty cool takes a while <laughs> it takes a long while i am going to change this once again free the data i'm going to place this even more downward because i want some more water over there and i'm going to increase the speed to 100 meters per second so it will be even faster and then i will take uh, what is it oh yeah the same plane and bring it upwards and also let's change this to around 70 meters per second and now we can bake it once again yeah that looks cool Ooh, i think our particle radius should be something like 1.1 and then I'm going to bake the mesh. Plato, of course, was the philosopher of the forms. And the forms were invisible, but structuring the universe. There is something about those trees that we can call tree-iness. All these other trees that we have here in the actual world are mere instances of these forms from the perfect form. So we have the perfect form and it's going down and you have an oak and you have all these different types of tree. Oh, my bake is done. So let's go right over here and look what it has given us. Actually, I do not want it. And I want you guys to be taught properly how to set this up. So I'm going to delete my bake, even though it costs a lot of time and a lot of headaches. I'm going to free the data. So right now, what I want to do is go over here to border collisions. And I'm going to turn all of this off. Now, what border collisions does is that it is showing us these bounds and these walls right over here. And when the liquid hits these walls, it actually has some sort of physical property acting upon it, which means that if our liquid hit the wall, it will bounce back. And this can be ruining your render because it might fill up your entire cube with water. This is something that we've often seen or it bounces off and it becomes quite unnatural because in the scene, there was nothing there to bounce off of. So it seems really weird. And that's why I'm turning off the border collisions because we do not need the water to interact with either the floor or the wall or the ceiling. So that's why I'm doing that. Let's look at our particle system. Oh, it looks so cool. I'm going to set the particle minimum a lot higher. I'm going to set it to 16. I'm going to set the particle maximum to 32. When you do this on resolution, 128 this will not deliver the most beautiful results but when you are doing your final bake this will deliver the most beautiful results and what it what it's taken care of is that it's making bigger particles which will clump towards each other so you don't have all these gaps and edges which kind of fiddle around sometimes so you don't want that and the narrow bandwidth that will make sure that it's stickier in a certain type of sense not like viscosity but it will make sure that these particles adhere to each other a little bit more so you don't get all these wonky details flickering around in your render which will really make your liquid simulation look bad so i like using these settings i'm just going to set this to 9 the minimum to 16 particles maximum to 38 32 32. What you can also do is if you think the render is going too fast, I don't think this is the case in my render, 
but you can change the time scale and this will adjust the simulation speed as it says when you hover your mouse over. You can set it to half the speed and it will slow down and make it look a bit more slow motion. But if you actually want to make it slow motion, you also have to go over here, change the frame rate to let's say 60 or 120 FPS, which means that in 120 frames, one second will have passed. So it's frames per second. And how many frames can you fit in that second? In DaVinci Resolve, I usually work with a 24 FPS or 30 FPS, usually 24 FPS timeline which means that if we have a 120 fps render it will be five times slower it is a second of the simulation but it is actually five seconds it's just really slow i'm going to set this to 60 fps and this means that we can slow it down by two and a half times so if you leave it on 24 fps and you want to speed ramp it in your editing program doesn't look good don't try it there's a lot of flickering in between why well if you have 24 frames in your second and you stretch it out to five seconds now these 24 frames have to compose those five seconds, which means that you only have like four and a half or 4.2 for each second. And that doesn't look good. All right, so that's why you need to do the 60 FPS or 120 FPS, just in case you wanted to know. And now I'm doing the bake. All right, so this is what the fluid simulation now looks like. And if we set this to our render mode, you can actually see that it's still just a white blob. So we are going to the shader editor and right over here, there's two options basically. We can either increase the transmission to one, change the color to whatever we like, something like this. And you can play around with the IOR, so right over here. Uh, one other option is to go over here, glass BSDF and plug that one in and this also looks very good if you ask me and change the color to whatever you like and you can once again change the IOR. So whatever you think looks better you can go for this one or you can go for this one. I kind of like the glass version in this uh, in this type so maybe I'm just going for the uh, glass material change the color around maybe uh, I want it to be a little bit lighter and this kind of gives us an impression of what the fluid actually looks like. So. Right now, our liquid simulation is pretty much done. There's a couple of things I want to tell you. We want to add a, a new modifier and it's going to be the smooth modifier. So if I turn this off, you can see that we have a lot of these edges and you can pretty much see the polygons uh, going around here. And I think the easiest way to get rid of those is to add a smooth modifier and repeat it as many times as possible. So this is one. This is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So now it already looks a lot better. Then I'm going back into the physics properties. I'm going to leave everything uh, of this as it is, but there is one setting under mesh and it's called use speed vectors. I am going to click on that. And the reason for it is that it kind of already calculates the motion blur for the particle simulation. So I like to click this on. So first I'm going to bake this out and then I will show you how to render this properly. Change the resolution division to 300, 350 because I'm feeling wild today. All right, so this is the fluid simulation. It looks very smooth, very cool. I think this is beautiful for our final shot. In the render settings right over here, I'm going to scroll down and under light paths, you can either change this to the max value in order to have the maximum amount of ray tracing possible for anything that we've added here. Let me just show you what it looks like. Full global illumination, and it's just a slight difference, but it can help. So check that out for your render for yourself. I'm just going to render this on default because I think it looks good. And right now under motion blur, I've got that ticked, of course. And right here we've got film, transparent, transparent glass. And the transparent glass will make sure that it is possible to place a different background behind this if you're rendering this out in, let's say, uh, transparency either way. So yeah, now you can see it. Uh, this is normal. And then with transparent glass, we have this type of simulation and you can place any background behind it that you want. I'm just going to render it out with my original plane because I think that is the aesthetic of the entire video and I'm going to stick with it. Fast GI approximation, it interprets the way that the ray tracing works. So it's not really calculating every frame but it is trying to make an interpretation of it. So fast GI approximation. And then we can increase the viewport bounces because as you saw when I just turned it on, this piece right here became a lot darker. So take a look at that. And now we have some black areas right there. And that's because it is interpreting the calculation instead of actually doing it. Right here, if we increase the viewport bounces, you can see that dark part 
soon disappears. Now this is on 8, so the render bounces should also be on 8. And I think this looks beautiful. Render animation. I've made two different liquid simulations and three different renders. Now I've only showed you how to make one of these, so I want you to make the other two yourself. On one of the renders I simply changed the camera angle, and on the other I used a curved path, as we did before in this free masterclass. So you should be able to figure this out. So in total I made three liquid renders that we are going to use in the final editing tutorial, but you don't have to do that and you can follow along just as well using one liquid render. But I do encourage, as a teacher, that you play around with this yourself and really solidify that knowledge that you've gained. If you like this content and feel like you'll benefit from being subscribed, then I highly recommend doing so. We're going to make the last animation of this free masterclass and it will be a reveal like this. We're going to keep it very simple and use the animation that we've created in the first part of this course. I'm certain you're subscribed by now, but if you forgot, please do and let's get started. All right, everybody. So we are heading back into one of the first renders that we made in this free masterclass. And right now I'm going to open it up. It's the one with the sliding animation. And the thing is, we want to make another animation for after our rotation animation because the transition that we have now doesn't look very slick and smooth and we need to change that. So sometimes you end up with this kind of process where you think you are done, but then actually there is something that could just be a little bit better and just spend some extra time on it. So it's not the most amount of time. I think the most amount of time we've spent thus far is for the liquid simulation and the liquid simulation was an absolute hell to get done because of the baking times and you just have to sit here and wait. You cannot use your computer in any way. Uh, but that is not the case for this one. So I've got an idea right here. Uh, of course, in this first animation, we've got this slide in effect, right? So it's going like this and then it stops right there, etc. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to have this same sort of slide in animation, but this time we are going to have it slide all the way across the screen. Then we're going to make these other colors appear from behind this movement. So that is basically the plan. So I'm going to file, save as, slide reveal. I'll call it the slide reveal. So I'm having it start right over there. And maybe what we can do is go over to this keyframe where this bottle is. Go to the graph editor and select the what kind of is the eye location open that up let's see what we've got i said it needs to go up yeah like this it needs to go up so let's see what that looks like and uh, now it's a bit too fast so i'm going to stretch it out mm, now it's a bit too slow so i'm going to bring it back to the left and i kind of like this so it reveals the other cans going behind it. So this is our animation for the can going to the right. Maybe we can select this and make this a little bit faster. That's slower now, so just a little bit faster. Yeah, I think that looks good. So the animations for this one we are going to delete. So I'm going to press on them. Then I'm going to check in the graph editor if they have their things unlocked. And right now I'm going to select both. Select all of these keyframes and once they are in their final position, I'll make sure to delete the keyframes. And now they do not move around anymore, which is what we want. So first of all, I am going to have a look at these lines because I think that if we enter in our, into our camera and show the thirds, they are exactly on the thirds, which was our initial goal. So if we just take this one and then divide this line as, uh, by two as well, so we get another line over here, I think that would be a beautiful position for this new can to be located at. So right here, G and Y, I'm going to place it right over there. First, let's, all, let's get all these uh, cans lined up. And this one as well over here. And I think what might be very funny is if this one is halfway, so like over here, then one of them comes from right over there towards the camera as well. So maybe that's a fun thing to do. I'm not entirely sure yet. I'm just going along as, I, uh, as I'm making the shot. I'm basically just making the shit up. So now it has to be revealed. As you can see on this frame, the can is entirely concealed. And the same goes for this frame, this frame, ooh, right over here we have a little bit of trouble. So I'm going to 
bring it slightly to the left. Just a little bit to game the system. And right over here, can this be covered up? Almost entirely, just going to game the system a little bit, like so. And now each of these has a frame in which they are fully hidden. And I'm going to each of those frames. So let's select this one, I, location, rotation and scale. Then I'm going to select this one, I, location, rotation and scale. Then I'm going to select this one, I, location, rotation and scale. And this one, I, location, rotation and scale. So now all of these have their keyframe at the point at which they are hidden. So if we hide them one frame before, so let's say we would place this underneath the plane and now it's into existence, nobody noticed. And right here, frame six. So I'm going to bring this down, I, location, rotation and scale, and now it exists. Frame 11, uh, bring it down, I, location, rotation and scale, now it exists. 16, I'm going to bring it down, I, location, rotation and scale, and now it exists. All right, so this is basically what happens. Bam, and they are all revealed. How cool does that look? And it didn't even cost a lot of time, and we didn't even have to animate anything because we already had our base set up. So this is going to be a very easy tutorial, guys. As we've got this one sliding over, this is approximately one second. So this one has probably already left the screen in a second, and we could play around with another second right over here until we are at frame 48. So what I'm going to do is we've got our slide in right here. Maybe when the can is over here, we could start a new transition with this can, for example. So I'm going to duplicate this, set it right over here, delete the keyframes. And now it's entirely hidden. So let's place a keyframe. And then when this is moving over there, I want this one to be moving to the front like so. Now it's not entirely centered. I think what we can do is if this is the true center, let's check in our camera. Yeah, I mean like something like this. Right, location, location, rotation, skill. Get out of here. Like this. So on frame nine, we should probably make it something like so. On frame eight, it shouldn't even exist. Pop, pop. All right, so this is how it works. So now we can see it coming into existence and it is correct. Cool. So now that we've got that, we've got a couple of reveals, including this one. And from here on out, I want this one to move forward like so. And maybe what I would like, although I'm not entirely sure just yet whether I'm going to do this, I'm going to select this edge by going into edge mode, shift S, cursor to select it, the pivot point, change it to 3D cursor, right here, and wobble it towards the front because it's moving forward, so it's got its head towards the front. So, all right, looks janky, that's good. Then we are going to have it stop right over there and it will revert back to its original position. So, like this. Yeah. Location, rotation, and skill. Don't mess around. All right, so like this. Let's see what it looks like. And it comes to a stop. And uh, I think that looks pretty cool. Let's see. Woo! And it's going that way. So we're going to stick with the original plan. We're just going to make it like this. Worst case scenario, we've got 34 frames and it ends right here. So what are we going to do? Going in here, I'm going to check the graph editor because this animation looks like shit. So going right over here and we are moving it on the X axis, I believe. Yes, so I'm going into the X location, lock everything except for the X. Change this animation to be smooth. You know the way, right? I'm going to set the handle type to free. And I want it to be fast in the beginning, like so, and then slow down near the end, chop, and come down to a halt. So 
we've got our rotation and the rotation is on the Y axis. So I'm just going to open up every rotation. I'm going to select this and uh, maybe select only the X and Y. Then we're going to select both of these, check if our individual centers are clicked. And right now, pop, pop, looks fantastic. Very good. So that is a pure 40 frames that we can use for this. 40 frames. And I wonder what it looks like, so let's see. We have got our different colors. Now I want this one to be the green color once again. I'm just going to eyeball it. I don't really care about the correctness of the hex code in this case. So I'm just going to click on this. And this color should be changed to, well, you guessed it, green. Now why do I choose green? We've already shown in the previous tutorial that there is a Canva tetradic color scheme. And I am using that color scheme in order to make this look good. So what I'm going to do is this one should be a different color. Why? Well, I don't know. Maybe we can make it white, for example, because why is this blue? This shouldn't be blue. So I'm just going to change this, make a new texture of it. And then right here, let's maybe go for a color that we haven't seen before. Maybe that would be interesting. Like, wow, is that, is that a special edition? Is that a special edition blender and a drink? Well, it just might be. So I'm going to make it uh, purple, let's say purple. And then right over here, I am going to keep this orange because I like blue, orange, and then we've got the green. And let's see, what can we make this color? Probably like a pinkish, but I don't want it to look too much like this. So green and blue are located next to each other and orange and red or yellow are located next to each other. So maybe we can try out red. Or maybe we can try out yellow. Ooh. I think yellow might be the way to go. I think this looks pretty decent. It kind of reminds me of Skittles and the way the colors are uh, and Smarties and stuff like that. So who cares? Let's go. This is our final animation. What I have done, I have got right here a light and this light. And of course you already know this because you followed the very first episode of this free masterclass. But this is the way our lighting se setup operates. Uh, one thing we can do is go into the camera, press on zero, and I think this is not sharp enough. So I'm going right over here and increase the f-stop until the background becomes entirely visible. So that's entirely visible. Now, we do not want that. <laughs> so we're going back, dial it back, dial it back, dial it back. 41 is very high, of course. I'm not going to dab around in it. F-stop 8, is that looking good? Might be a bit too much still, so I'm going into F-stop 13. Let's select this can, by the way, because we've got another can selected. Don't want that. Just want to select this can. Select the can, go into the shader editor. Maybe the value could go up just a bit. So this looks pretty good, and I think I have all my colors ready like so. Now what happens if we play our animation? Let's save. And... Yeah, yeah, lots of movement. Reveals, Shoo. reveals always look cool by the way. Also in movies when you have a camera going backwards and then a person comes into frame, always looks cool, so just keep that in mind. So I think this is good. We can press on render and have this rendered out. We can also try and add a volumetric. So let's add a cube and I'm going to bring it upwards. S, X, S, Y, S, Z. Then I'm going into the shader editor, new, delete the principal BSDF by pressing X, shift A, principled volume, enter the volume into the volume, press on zero so that we can see what we're doing. Make sure this is turned off so we can actually see our entire scene. Density, bring it back. I don't want this to be too much. One thing I do not like, we need to fix that, definitely, is the amount of droplets that we have on here. I can barely see them, so we do not want that. I am going to select this can, and as you can see, there are droplets on this, but you can just barely see it. Uh, I'm heading over into a new tab, just going to slide this out, I'm going to add a geometry node setup, which we've already got, by the way, but I'm just going to add it in this uh, vision. And as you remember, we've got our icosphere, which is being 
uh, placed on this one, the random value and map range node determine the scale. So we have uh, random valuations. This one is smaller than this one, for example. But what we need to do is increase the two max. We need 0 0.05. All right, so this is indeed the correct scaling for these droplets. I think they are visible enough now. And maybe we can use a little bit more of them. So we've got our geometry node density set up right here. I'll show you how that worked. We plugged it into this group input slot and now we can play around with it manually in our modifiers just as if it is a modifier that we created for ourselves. 13, not too much. All right, so this looks pretty good. Now we've actually got some visible droplets on here and uh, I think this looks fine and dandy and we can just uh, go over to the rendering of this image, I believe. I think there's nothing much more to be done. So this is basically what we've got. We have got our reveal animation and the purples coming forward and coming to a standstill. So that's basically it. Uh, we've got our volumetric added. We've got our different colors. We've got a reveal, our animation. Everything is done. So we're going to just render this animation out. And then in the final video, we are going to edit this entire piece together and I will show you exactly how to make sure that it fits the beat, that we have enough frames in our animation so that you can calculate backwards. And once we've done that, we are going to make sure that it looks slick and smooth and that the animation is worth selling. So, so we've created all the renders of this product animation masterclass and now we are going to edit everything together. If you've never used DaVinci Resolve before, no problem, I'm going to guide you through every step. And if you haven't even downloaded it, go ahead and do that, it's completely free. If you are using Premiere Pro, then translate this video to your own video editor. You'll figure it out. So without further ado, let's get started. So this is what DaVinci Resolve looks like when you open it up. I've blurred some things out to protect my client's integrity, but we're going to press on Untitled Project and then it will open up this workspace right here. It's the cut page. We don't work in the cut page. We are going to the edit page straight away because this is where we're going to do the bulk of the work. Uh, I'm going to try and make this as beginner friendly as possible. If you've never used DaVinci Resolve before, it's free. You can go ahead and download it on their website, the Blackmagic Design website, and we can edit our product animation in here entirely for free and it's going to be awesome. So first, we're going into our product animation folder right over here, expansion H, product commercial free course, then the product final animations, and then I'm going to take this, press Control A because it's all PNGs, just like we discussed in the previous videos. And I'm going to drag it in like this. And now we have our video right over here. Now it's quite slow and we are going to solve that. I'm actually going to work with an MP4, but if you're actually doing client work, you might not want to work with an MP4 because each time you render something in MP4, the quality gets worse. So you want to keep that to a minimum. So there are a lot of images and each of them have a pretty large file size. So DaVinci Resolve has some trouble playing this in your timeline. Now, if you do want to work with PNGs, what you can do is you can click on playback timeline proxy resolution and set it to quarter. This will reduce the quality to one fourth of what we've actually rendered. And now it will play back sort of fine. And if it's still not working for you, you can go over to the playback, render cache and set it to smart. And usually you get a blue line over here, which shows you how much of the video is rendered in the cache. It's not showing up right now, it's trying to be funny, but uh, we're not going to be impressed by it. Just use it if you want to render this into a cache. This is what DaVinci Resolve looks like. We've got our workspaces over here. This is the editing tab, the fusion tab, the color grading tab, the sound tab, and we are not going to use any of these except for the editing tab and the color grading tab and maybe the fusion tab for one specific render later. Over here we've got our toolbox and there you have video transitions, audio transitions, titles, generators, all that good stuff. Here is our media timeline, which means that everything we drag into here, it will also show up over here. You can also drag everything in here and then you can drag it from there to there. And this is the inspector and here you can scale things up and move the position, etc. We're going to work with that in a minute. But first we are going to render this out as an MP4 because I want this tutorial to be pretty fast and not having to wait for a cache bake each time that I want to have an animation shown to you guys. So how are we going to do that? We are going to add every single uh, render that we've got into this timeline. So we've got the can swipe transition going to drag it in there. We've got the pop-in animation, going to drag it in there. And you can do this for yourself. I'm just going to skip ahead. I think you get the gist. You just go into your folder, you grab all the images you have and drag it in here. Very easy and I'll see you in a bit. So I've got everything lined up right here. These are all the renders that we've made throughout this course. 
and I'm going to drag the music to the side because I do not want it to be a part of my MP4. And I'm going to go with my timeline all the way over here. Just drag this red bar, set it to the side, press on I to set this uh, in point. And then over here we can press O and it will set an out point. Now I'm going to press Control S and this is going to be the masterclass editing. Now I'm heading over to this rocket icon right here. You'll find it next to the music icon. And when you press on the rocket icon, you can export your video. And that is what we are going to do. So right over here, I'm going to call it MP4 product animation. Just going to copy that, then on browse, going into my folder, right over here, going to make a new folder, folder, give it this same name and save. And right over here, instead of QuickTime, you want to select MP4. And that is basically it. So it's set to single clip, 24 frames per second, does that automatically. We've got it to MP4, and now I'm going to press on add to render queue. Render all. Once again, you do not have to do this step. You can work with the PNGs and it will actually be a better quality in the final. But I'm just going to do it on an MP4 because it's way faster for my machine. And I can show you clearly what is going on without having to wait each minute. All right, so the render is done and I'm going to delete all of this except for this swipe transition that we've made. And why am I not going to delete this? Well, MP4 doesn't have a transparent background, so this will just be black and we do not want this. Right now, if we place this over our other render, you can see it is actually transparent right over there. And it's very slow, so I'm going to delete all of these images and I'm going to bring in my MP4, MP4. And now when we play this back, it's actually very smooth and it goes a lot faster. Now all we have to do is make sure that this looks cool on the music. We're going to add some zoom effects. We're going to make some other cool effects as well. And I'm going to try to give you some of these editing principles that will help you in the future. So it's not simply going to be a cutting along tutorial and we're going to edit this, make a cut here, make a cut there. I'm going to explain the thought process behind editing this entire piece. So I'm heading over to YouTube. You might've heard about it. So I'm going to type in vlog, fashion, anime, children of light. And then right here we get a video by infraction and this is the one that we need. So I'm going to copy this link and I'm heading over to this website which is called ytmp3.nu. You can also just type YouTube to mp3 and then you will find it right over here. But if you've got another one that works, no problem. Just make sure you're not clicking on the virus. Right here, ytmp3, and you can paste your link in this bar, convert it, and then you can download it. So do mind, you cannot just use this music in a product commercial that you're going to run ads with on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. So look in their description and always make sure that it is commercially free. And if it's not, don't use it for a product commercial. I'm going to use this for YouTube and I am allowed to do that because it is 100% no copyright royalty free. But if you want to use it in commercial project, you must be subscribed to inaudio.org. So make sure that whenever you're using music in your editing process, that it has the right license. Either way, I'm just going to use this one for my product commercial because I'm only going to drop it on YouTube. I mean, it's the blender and the tutorial drink. I haven't made an actual drink, guys. And now I'm going to add the correct music. So here we are back in DaVinci Resolve and we've got our music and you might be able to hear it through the microphone. It starts kind of slow, you get some piano coming in. And this, of course, is not interesting for our product commercial. So I'm going right over here. That's what we want. That's what we want. We want to have a beat. Because if you have a beat, you have something to add it to. So I'm going to pick a moment right here. Just something like that. All right, so I'm going to bring this over here. I'm going to make sure that it kind of looks all right with the render we've got. No, it's too slow, so I'm going to make it shorter right over here. All right, cool. So I'm in my editing program. We are going to use the arrow keys in order to find our black spot right here. And I'm going to click on B to have our cutting mechanism and we're going to cut this away. So right now I'm moving over here and take all of this out. And right now there shouldn't be any black, black frame, so I missed one. It's right over here. 
and we can place our pop-in animation right next to our slide-in animation. And of course, it's a giant MP4, so we have to cut everything by hand. And now we still have our PNG swipe transition, and I'm going to place it right over here and make sure that it looks correct. So I'm going to use this one, the arrow to the left to move a frame. And I do not want to see the shot change over here. And now the transition is correct. Uh, let's see. I think this beat can be a little bit faster, so I'm going to drag this to the side. All right, cool. Uh, and now I actually want to have a zoom in effect on this can. So what I'm going to do is I'm heading over into our toolbox and right here you can press adjustment clip or just type adjustment clip. And if you're on any other place than the toolbox, you will not find it. So we're going to drag the adjustment clip into our timeline and the beat starts over here. So I'm going to make it shorter on both sides like this and I want it to be zoomed in until the end of the animation and I'm going to drag our can transition to the top. Now drag this back down. If you hold shift it will stay in place instead of move around too much. So on the adjustment clip I'm heading into the inspector right over here and we can press on zoom and these are the keyframes and I'm going to make one for the position as well. So right over here we want it to zoom in on the beat. So maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away these keyframes, make it just a little bit longer, and right over here I place my keyframes. And right here we want it to be zoomed in. So exactly when the beat happens, it should be zoomed in. And I'm actually not going to use the position. There you go. Yeah, so then when the uh, zoom in ends, the can is also back in its place and it's right on the ground. And that's why I'm going for this type where on the beat, something of action happens. Already it looks a lot better than what we had before. So consider this without the swipe transition and the adjustment layer, it looks like this. I mean, it's not bad because the renders are pretty cool but just a little bit more. Cool, cool, cool. So this is actually the first part done. We've got our zoom in animation and actually one little touch that we can add is another adjustment clip. So I'm going to drag an adjustment clip right over here, press B, cut away this side and by pressing on the backspace key, don't press on the lead, because if you press on the lead, a lot of other clips will be moved as well. Press on backspace, and right over here, we have the adjustment clip. I'm going to search for zoom blur. And zoom blur is not in the toolbox because it's in the open effects. So this is just something that you have to know and it comes with time and experience. But this is in the open effects, which means that it comes from a fusion type uh, of plate. So zoom blur, I'm going to drag it right over here and that makes sure that it has this zoom in effect. So I'm going to make it very extreme for you. And this is what it looks like. You can also do it the other way around. And then it looks like this. So I'm going to place it on zero, add a keyframe on the beginning. Then on this button right here, you can click and you can see where the keyframes are located for our other adjustment clip. So what I want to do, at the moment it starts moving, so one frame into it, I want this to be stronger. Because we have movement, and we did not render actual motion blur in Blender for this move. So I'm going to add it manually. So now we have that right over there, then one frame before it stops, I'm going to press the keyframe button once more, and then on the frame that it lands, I'm going to set it to zero. Let's see what it looks like. It gives it some energy. I think it's a bit too much. So I'm going to decrease the strength of this. So it's 560. Maybe we can set it to something lower like 260. And right over here, 260, 0 0.26. And the rest is fine. And there you go, it's a lot more subtle. And you can go for whatever effect you like. So if you do want it to be extreme, just increase the value, no problem, man. So bam. All right, so right now we have got the uh, scale pop-in. And then the camera moves up 
and it moves upward in the next scene as well. Like that. And one thing that I find that I do not like is that it becomes really gray. And the reason for it is that we did not place extra lighting on our backdrop when we made this move. But it's not a problem because we can fix it either way. So we've got our solid in the toolbox, you get a solid color. So I'm going to drag this on here and make it a whole lot smaller. Take this away, press backspace. I'm going to change the color in the inspector and it's going to be white. So right over here, I'm going to feel when all my cans are removed. And that is over here. So over here, I want this solid color to, to start and the animations start on this frame. So I'm going to head in one frame before that, drag out our solid color and make sure that it ends right over there. Then I'm going to drag on this little white bar, which is an opacity, so I'll show you what that means. It, uh, it's, it's even uh, better to see it right over here. So it is becoming wider through time. So it's basically like keyframing the opacity. Either way, I'm going to place that over there, make it slightly like this. And I think it should be a bit more aggressive. And it could be one frame longer. Because it's coming in. And then here it should fade out. And now it's way too heavy. And the reason for it is that this white is not the same as this white. But I'm going to leave it like this for now because we are going to color grade all of these shots. It will slow down your computer because color grades is more computation power, which simply means that we're going to do it at the end. So first get the animation right, get the editing in place, and then do the color grading. And you will not have any struggles with playing this back. So we're just going to keep it like that. And this render is not the render we needed uh, to come after this one because we specifically made this last frame the first frame of our next animation which is the camera pendulum animation so now we got the camera pendulum swing animation and we have to cut these out by hand because we turned it into an mp4 and now they're all jumbled up check so this is our black animation and by the way you can press on this link button and then it will unlink the sound from the video and i'm just going to leave all the soundless parts of this mp4 because we do not need it and you can also place these behind each other if you think that's cool so look at this i'm not a fan i like the original idea better so i'm just going to do that i'm going to cut everything up so i'll see you in a bit all right so we have all our colors right here and i'm going to place the black one right after this animation and it lines up. So now I'm going to drag all of these animations on top of each other and I first want it to become blue, then I want it to become green, then I want it to become, or actually I want it to become green, then orange, and then pink. And pink is going to be the last one. Now we've got them all placed on top of each other and the name of the game is we just simply have to make them all decrease their length. Uh, proportionally. So if we hear the hi-hats, listen up. If you can hear that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then I'm going to decrease this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then I'm going to decrease this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Decrease this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Decrease this. And now, uh, it isn't transitioning smoothly because we haven't added the uh, like opacity, but we can do that. Let's see what it looks like for now, just to get the gist of it. The animation needs to come in. I'm just going to set it to plus zero, 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 two. And I'm going to do the same for this one, same for this one, same for this one. All right, looks very cool. So now we can add our reveal animation and set it right afterwards. And this is the moment the beat drops, which is what I wanted to tell you is when I'm working on this, I made this render first. I render it out and then I place it right over here. All right, looks good. The beat starts over here. Is there perhaps something we can do? Uh, can we increase the length? No, that wouldn't look good. Okay, so I gotta make another shot and make sure it transitions smoothly. 
because there's not a bead right here and you can cut on the bead and it really doesn't matter because uh, it is expected to see change when the bead changes as well. And that's what we have right over here. So as you can see, the moment that the pendulum swings ah, and it goes on the action and on the action we cut as well and there's more movement going on. So that is good. Uh, then we have some liquid animations. Let's see, I've got this one. And it's all very slow because it's set to 60 FPS and I'm going to show you how to speed ramp this. All right, so we've got that one and we've got this one. Cool. Uh, so first of all, where is another beat drop? Because... All right, so I don't like this part. It's like the end of the song part. And I actually want the song to loop, uh, because as you saw in the product animation, I do a zoom in effect in one of the letters and then it changes all over again. So it's like the white of the letters becomes the new white background on which all these animations happen. I want the music to at least somewhat align for people to think it is looped. So it doesn't have to be perfect, it just needs to be good enough. Uh, so let's see, right over here, I'm going to cut this. So we've got the ah, uh, ah, uh, which is our beginning. So if we add it right over here, so if we remove this all the way over here. All right, pretty good. We can change this. I think it can be slightly better. Yeah, so that's it. So it's not perfect because we cut the beat literally in half and that doesn't sound good at all, but it is a way to create a loop. And even though it is forced, it does make the animation better and maybe makes people want to watch the ad for longer. Now you can spend a lot more time on this. I'm just taking the first part of the song basically and working with it. And I didn't spend a lot of time doing the sound design. So first of all, we've got something that loops now and that is what we want. So this is going to be the duration of our uh, entire animation. And we already know that now. So I'm heading over to this side. And by the way, if it's not clicking for you on this part, uh, you have a little magnet right here. And right now it's pretty free, but if you have the magnet, it will snap to this part automatically, kind of like the snap tool in Blender as well. So I'm going to place this right over there, press on my left arrow key, and then press O for out point. For some reason, when you're standing on the last frame and you press O, it places it one frame later. And this is just a DaVinci Resolve thing, but you will get one black frame and it will be really noticeable when you render the final animation. So click on the final part, one frame back, and then click on O. And now you can see that this is aligned with this and it is totally correct. So liquid animations. And of course, this is way longer. Actually, just one of those is already enough. Uh, to cover the entirety of this. Uh, so we want to do some speed ramping. So right here we've got this. I think it looks pretty cool. But I'm going to do the last part first. And on this beat, we want the slow motion to happen. So basically what's going on, maybe we can drag this out until it is entirely white. And then control R. And, it will and this will bring up your speed ramping controls. So right over here, you can add a speed point. And now you've got these little handles that you can manipulate and you will see the percentage uh, of the speed change. So I'm going to change this to around 233, 260, something like that. We've done it in 260 FPS, which means that we can speed up two and a half times without loss of quality. And we have enough frames for that. So, all right. So it's going very fast. Maybe we can emphasize it a bit more. Cool. And now when we drag the speed point exactly on this beat. Bam. See what I mean? And now the slow motion is happening exactly on the beat. And that is what we want. Cool. Cut this off. This is the entire end clip. Looks cool. And now we have to use those other two renders to fill up the rest. So right over here. And 
Let's see what we can do with this. First, I'm going to do this one. And I also want to speed ramp it. So let's see, this can be fast. And then we slow it down over here. Control R, add a speed point, make this 260%. Cool, just going to cut it somewhere random for now. Let's see. So we've got it to 250 right now. Just going to decrease the length. All right, so listen up. You've got a hi-hat over there. And if you can hear that, that is where we're going to cut. Right over there. So if you think this animation is on the wrong position, you do not have to redo your entire retime controls. You can just take the bottom part of this and then change the location of it. So maybe something like this. And then one frame back, I'm going to delete all of this. And then right here, I'm just going to pick a smooth position for this one. Maybe starting from over here to over there. Something like that. Control R, change speed. Uh, actually, all the way until here should be sped up. So we're going to add a speed point and increase it all the way up there. Ooh, <laughs> pretty cool actually, when it's that hard. <laughs> Looks kinda cool. Maybe it's a bit too much. It's 1400%. And over here, there's another uh, snare. That's basically the way uh, that I do it. So that is the control R part. We have actually got our entire product animation. So let's have a look right now and see whether there's something that we want to change. All right, so first of all, <laughs> I'm just going to cut it right there. We've got our adjustment clip and our zoom clip right over here. And there is a uh, snare. You can hear it. I'm going to turn this solid up, I'm going to take the adjustment clip, bring it right over here, so that on the end of this, so when the snare begins, it's zoomed in. Cool. Looks cool. So before we head on over in the color grading tab, I noticed that I made a mistake. Namely, that I took my adjustment clips, but I didn't actually copy them. So I'm going to select both of them, hold Alt, and bring them over to this side and make sure that they are once again aligned to this beat drop. And that's right over here, so. Cool. So yeah, that's the way you can copy things. You just hold Alt and drag it, and then you have your extra clips. So this is what we've got thus far. So right now I'm heading over into the color tab. I'm going to select this clip, click on this icon right here. It's a painter's palette. And right now I think this is a bit too uh, non-contrasty. So I'm going to make a new note, Alt S, and this will be a new note. So this kind of works the same as in Blender. It's just a node network. And right here we've got our effects. These are the nodes. You want to have this clicked. And these are our clips. I'm going to unclick it because I like more space so we can zoom in. And right here we have our lift, gamma, gain, etc. I've got a free course on compositing where this is explained in depth, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. So first of all, Alt S. So over here we have our HDR sliders and I want to change the exposure. So there's actually two ways to change the exposure, or actually multiple ways, but 
first of all you get the slider right here and you can do this and it kind of works like a brightness node I'm not going to explain that right now and right here we've got our exponential and this will make sure that the exposure is a lot more natural instead of just some white mathematical equation going over the entire image so i'm going to increase this exposure slider and let's see what that did for us so this was pretty dark at first and now it's pretty lightened up so i'm going to set it to 0 0.3 and now i like the way that this white looks and now I'm going to add some contrast and maybe we decrease the global by the way because we're going to add contrast so I'm going to set it to 0 0.2 and it's a bit brighter then we're going over into this tab and right here we have contrast I'm going to increase it ever so slightly and then the pivot can be turned back or forward depending on your preference I like to turn it a little bit back so it brings back some of our highlights and if we look at what we've done by pressing shift D you can already see this was pretty bland and now it's a lot more bright and visually interesting to look at. Uh, one thing we can do, and uh, maybe I'm not going to actually do this, but let's see what it does for us. I'm heading over into this tab and I'm going to increase the red output, the green output and the blue output. And now it is very saturated. So in the output gain, so over here you've got all of these boxes, you can select this one and the gain you can decrease it in order to get a value that you like. And I think I like 0 0.3, so it's a little bit more popping into the eye, but not that much so that it detracts from the animation. So this looks pretty good, and I'm not going to do anything else with it. What you could do is you can Alt-S, add a film grain to give it one of those camera effects that you may like. Um, I'm not going to do that, just going to increase the strength for now so you can see what it does. So it increases the grain on your footage to make it seem real. Not going to do that, just going to delete this. I'm going to keep this clean and 3D. So this one is done. I actually don't want to do all the same work for this one again. So I'm heading over into the color tab, clicking on clips. And then right here, you can see that we've got it selected. And this one is the one that we already graded. That is shown by the rainbow color around this zero one. So I'm going to press middle mouse button on this. And now it applies the same color grade on this render as well. And I think it looks fine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. You can do that. You can tweak some things if you'd like. And right over here, I'm heading over into the next one. Do not select the adjustment clips. Because if you add an adjustment clip and add another color grade on it, it will double it. So don't do that. Make sure that you've got the actual render selected. I'm going to click on this one, and now it has applied our color grade. I'm going to click on this one, it has applied our color grade, and we can move forward like this. I'm going to click on this one, and this is very green. So I do not like that, and I'm heading over to this side, Alt-S, make a new node, and right over here we've got our curves. So I'm going to this side, and it's called Hue versus Saturation. And now I'm going to select this color. You can select it on the screen by pressing and holding and get a range of that color. But we can also see that the color green is the most prevalent in our color setup. And right now, when I drag this downwards, it becomes less saturated. So let's see what it did for us. So it's very green over here. And I think, I mean, it looks nauseating, but now it's a bit more subtle. It can actually be a little bit more yeah, something like this. Maybe we can extend this. A little bit more. Pretty good. And what we can also do is go to the Hue versus Luma. And click on this color green. And then turn this down or upwards in order to make it brighter or darker. And I'm just going to subtly make it something like this. So this is the before, this is the after, and you can press Ctrl D on any node to turn it off and turn it back on. So over here it was pretty nauseating green, and now we've got something a lot more natural looking. So I'm going to select this orange color and then click on the blue color setup because I do not want to take out any greens out of this orange color, that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, and I think it could be a little bit more orange, so I'm going to add another node. And on this node we can, let's go to the saturation, or maybe we can change the color. So right over here, I can select all the reds, and now I can change the color and make it a little bit more, yeah, orangey. I mean, I could make it purple, blue, or whatever. I'm going to make it a bit more orange. And I also want to go to the hue versus luma, select the red, make it a tad bit brighter. 
I'm not entirely sure about the color yet though, so maybe we can go over into the saturation, select the reds, make it a little bit more saturated, and now it's pretty cool orange. So let's see what we've done. This is what it looked like before, this is what it looks like now. And uh, I think that looks a lot better, it's a lot more orange. So if you're having trouble with that, you can always change things in DaVinci Resolve, which is a nice trick. So now that you've got that in your toolbox, we can color grade the other can, which is over here. I'm going to select the blue one, and this is fine for my taste. And then we've got our swipe transition. I'm going to select this very same color grade. I'm not going to do anything fancy, just going to select it. And right here, we can select it as well. Ah, it looks pretty decent. Going over here, select it as well. Looks pretty decent. Select it, select it. All right, so if you want to change the color of like the uh, fluid, you can do that. So you can go over here and right now we can see the hue versus hue and we want to change the orange. I'm going to select that and it should be a broader range, a whole lot broader. And you can change the color of your liquid simulation. So if you rendered it out in orange, no problem, you can make it blue, it's, it's not really an issue. So uh, it might cause some unnatural artifacting. So right over here, there's a little bit of orange and we don't want to have that. So you, you have to play around with the sliders to remove some of that and maybe pick a color that really handles it well. So this blue color is doing pretty fine. You can change the color of your liquid simulation if you want to do that and you were not happy with your result at first. But I am happy with my results, so I'm going to delete this and it's orange and it's just going to stay orange. And let's see what we've got now. So the final effect is going to be to zoom in into one of the letters and actually if you did this in Blender it's going to be a lot more higher quality because we actually move the camera in space. But I'm not going to do that, I think this method is way easier and also delivers a pretty decent result. So I'm heading over into this one, I'm going to type uh, Ctrl R to remove our read time and right here we have our fusion composition. So I'm going to duplicate this clip first of all, so hold Alt, drag it upwards, so now we have something extra to work with in case we mess it up. So here we have our fusion clip, we've got the media in, and now I want to add a DVE. A DVE is kind of like a transform node with some extra properties. So we can use the Z move, which is right over here, and make sure that it can come closer into the camera. And lo and behold, what do we have? It goes right into the D, which is what we want. What I'm going to do is I am going to start this animation, preferably on a place where the B drops. I think right over here. So there's a base tone right there. As you can see, maybe one frame, so like this. Then I'm going into the DVE and it's located at that exact frame. I'm going to press on the keyframe for the Z move. Then I'm going to the last keyframe and make sure that it's all the way in, like so. And now it's heading into the can. But I think this animation looks a little bit weird and linear and that is the case because if we open up the spline editor right here and open up our move, you can see it is a linear move and I do not want that. So I'm going to change this ease and set it to, uh, what was it again, in cubic. And then it's slowly moving in and going over there. So I'm just going to copy this one and place it on the right side to see. Now it's too fast. So we can actually see it's too fast. Should be a lot slower around here. So maybe we can uh, manipulate that. Go over here, called input rhetoric. Not actually see the final frame going in there. So I'm not a big fan of that. So first of all, going over here, and now it's on zero, but over here I want it to be this far. Maybe we can manipulate it like this. Let's see. Maybe it looks janky. Alright. There you go. 
now we actually have the idea as if we're going into that letter. Uh, one thing we can do is add another zoom blur. So head back over into the DaVinci Resolve Fusion tab and click on this keyframe right here so that we're starting the zoom blur at the right time. Shift space, zoom, blur. And I want it to start right here. 0 0.4 looks pretty cool. I'm going to go one frame backwards, set it to zero and maybe one and a half it all the way until the end. So it doesn't really matter. Okay, let's go. Maybe we want it to become more extreme over time. So I'm heading over into the zoom blur once again and increase this like so. Cool. All right. So let's have a look at our animation. I think it can be a little bit more contrasty because you can see the difference between this shot and this shot and it's kind of taking my eye away from it. So this should be a little bit more contrasty. Heading over into the color grading tab, increase the contrast like so, something like this. to show you one more trick that you can add right over here because there's uh, an extra uh, snare. I'm going to duplicate this one, head over into the color grading tab, Alt S, extra, add an extra node and then we can select edge detect, edge detect right over here and it's on RGB X, uh, it's on RGB edges and you can change the edge width and I'm just going to do something like this, brightness, maybe a little bit more, gamma, mm. Something like this. And now when we go to this frame, one, two frames, uh, maybe it's a bit too short. A little bit longer. Yeah. That's just a little something you can add. I'm not going to add that because I was doubting it earlier before. And usually when I doubt about something, I just go for the safe road and make sure that it looks slick and smooth and that it's professional enough, even though I like the creative idea of this. Makes it look cool, but you can decide for yourself whatever you want to do with this edit. I hope you learned a lot in this video. We edited the entire product commercial. We have gone through it in quite a tempo. We've color graded everything. We even went into the Fusion tab and made sure that we can zoom into our can. It looks pretty rad and the animation loops as well. So the key points I want you to take away from this class is that you can cut on the action and on the beat and make sure that the shots have smooth transitions between them. If you are making this, you can speed ramp some of your shots. You have to think that out before because if you were to speed up 24 frames like we talked about, uh, you cannot fit 24 frames in five seconds. It will just look janky. So you need to take that into account. So I hope this free course was useful for you. I enjoyed it a lot. It cost a lot of time to make as well. So click on subscribe and I'm certain you won't be disappointed in the future with anything I will upload. And you might think this was the end, but I actually got something special for you in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this free masterclass. I'll see you in the next video. The process of idea creation is the one and only force of human thought that drives humanity forward. Humans build on existing knowledge and we don't have to reinvent the fire every single generation. But what we do need to do is understand the idea of fire better. And thus we started to use fire to cook, to keep us warm and to bring light in the darkness. We learned how to use fire to change the properties of objects so it can change from one form into another. Then we started to use fire to burn coal, set things in motion and use other forms of energy such as electricity you see, progress is driven by the creation of ideas. Fire is still fire, 
the true times, we changed our idea of fire and transformed the way we live. First of all, I'm the Blender Ender and I teach Blender on YouTube, but I'm also a philosopher, having studied philosophy at the University of the Free in Amsterdam. For the past couple of years, my mind was occupied with thinking thought itself. How do we think? How do ideas change? And most important of all, how can we create good ideas? First, you need to understand this one big idea, and I call it idopoeia. It comes from the Greek word eidos, which means idea. And poeia comes from the word poesis, which means to make or to create, which is where we get the word poetry from. Idopoeia means idea creation. The ultimate form of idea creation that pervades all others is becoming. But for the sake of simplicity, I will call it transformation, even though that isn't entirely accurate. But I want everybody to be able to understand this in the most simple way possible. I know this is quite a lot for a product animation tutorial, but it is going to be worth it, trust me. Transformation is what drives ideas forward. And there are multiple modes of transformation that you can use to create new ideas. Therefore, be aware that this video might change your thought forever, ironically speaking, because I'm simply going to explain how thought already works. Keep that in mind and there is no going back. The goal of this video is for you to be able to come up with the best product animation ideas and use my guide for human thought as a way to achieve that. The world of matter as it is doesn't include as much as the idea, but the idea includes the world of matter. The idea is therefore whole existence is mind. 10 important steps of coming up with ideas for product animation. Transformation is the process of changing one object to another object. You can fill in the formula X becomes Y. So a can becomes fluid or a letter becomes a number. A blue can becomes an orange can. Transformation can take place in so many different forms. Basically take anything in Blender and transform it from point A to B. Technically speaking, Transformation is the most important form that pervades all other modes of determination. The change of a location from point A to B can be seen as a transformation, for example. That's why it's called transform in Blender. Either way, you'll see how everything is actually a part of transformation. Think about this for yourself. You can use this to create new ideas for product animations. Simply transform X into Y. Movement. If you have an object in Blender, you can move it in all axes, the X, Y, and Z axis. Any motion is possible. You can rotate, slide, move it forwards or backwards, make it wobble, turn or fall. All these properties pertain to movement. This shouldn't be hard to figure out for yourself. Just keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate movement. You're a person in time and space yourself, so just look at your hand and the motions it can make. You'll find enough product animation ideas simply doing that. Combination. You can combine different objects together to make a new one. This is actually very helpful if you're an entrepreneur and you want to make a product. Look at a car, for example. It is a combination of different ideas into one. We have a motor, but there are wheels as well. You can sit in a chair and listen to music on the radio through your speakers. It is actually a giant combination of different things put together. You can use this in product animation by using a mathematical approach. Simply add X to Y. So if you have a can, you can add fluid. Or if you have the can in motion, add a geometry node setup that makes things grow as it moves. Can itself is already a combination of different things. It has a body. There's fluid in there. Droplets on it. You can drink from it because there's an opening mechanism. It's made of different materials etc. So combining things with each other is a great way to come up with ideas in general, but also for product animations. The same is true the other way around. You can subtract things from an object, which is the fourth form, subtraction. Take something away that was already there. For example, an icon of a telephone that you remove from the screen, or you remove the orange color from a render and make it black and white. You could remove a light by having it go backwards and slowly disappear from our vision, or have the object go out of screen. This is what you can do with subtraction, and it's a great way to come up with product animation ideas. Next is creation. Creation is different from combination, because it pertains to our perceiving of being and nothingness. So, if something isn't there, now it is. It has been created from nothing. Look at this scale pop in animation, for example. It wasn't there. So there isn't anything to combine it with, but now it is in existence. It has been created. You can use this to create from nothing and add to your product animations. Same goes for this reveal animation. It didn't exist, but now there's cans coming from behind our sliding can. Alternatively, there is destruction. Namely, when something goes from being to nothingness. You can remove an object or destroy its appearance. So let's say you use a quick explode. The object is no longer recognizable as the object it was before. It has been destroyed. It has lost its form that made it characteristic for that object. So you can destroy things and make it look special in your product animation. Unity. Unity is when separate things come together. 
all of them are in existence. They simply go to each other to become one formed object. It is actually seeing the object as its part and making it whole. One example of this would be this headphone, which transformed from a seemingly incoherent blob of sand to a product. It is unified in the end and brings the product into existence. The same goes for assembly animations, where different things come together to assemble a product. I mean, this entire video is already my philosophy applied to product animation. It is already a transformation where both are combined in a coherent unity. Separation. Separation is the act of taking the whole and dividing it into its parts. These type of animations are very popular and it's often used to show what different parts of a mechanical product is made of. Now all these modes of transformation can be used together as well. You can move an object while transforming it into another, so the can becomes smoke while moving or the color changes while it moves. You can separate objects and turn it into a different object with the same materials, such as transformers. You can take a product, smash it into another product and combine the two to make a new product. The possibilities are endless. If you learn diligently what I've laid down in this video, you'll realize it's not only for product animations. It is quite literally how you think. You can use it to come up with ideas for anything that you do, be it in work, relations, creating products, doing movements with your body, everything. Now in this video I've only touched the surface, it's actually way deeper than I explained it. I'm slowly working on writing a book on this for future philosophers, but I'm not done thinking yet. This means that the information you have right now is incomplete. There is a world out there, go find the One Piece! <laughs> I've only given what is absolutely necessary for coming up with ideas for product animation, and I hope this video succeeded in doing that. And if you want to become an undeniable force in the 3D space, then you need to become the undeniable force of the idea. And as I said in the beginning of this video, we do not have to reinvent the fire. And that's why I made a product animation inspiration compilation and it's absolute fire. So click here to watch that video next.